everybody joining. Um, okay, we're, we're currently coding on it, code it, so hopefully Rosemary will be able to overcome the technical difficulties. Uh, can we get confirmation started from broadcasting that we're live? Live now. Okay, um, everybody, uh, I'd like to um, welcome you to this, this morning's meeting of the Agriculture, Environment and uh, Rural Affairs uh, Committee. Um, we, we have a quorum, and, uh, uh, and if there's any issues with the uh, Starleaf, uh, either put it into the, the WhatsApp group or, or make, it, make it known now. Um, I want to just remind, remind members that, as usual, whenever we're in the meeting, can you mute your microphones until you actually need to speak? Uh, as all background noises and conversations will be heard. And should any member wish to join, please let me know using the uh, WhatsApp facility. Uh, I want to advise uh, members that today's meeting, we have been expected a briefing from Minister Lyons on his priorities, but Minister Poots is now back in post. And that's that's great to see that he um, has health, uh, you know, as a position where he feels that he's able to be, be back and it's good to see him back. And he'll be in attendance today alongside the senior DRO official, officials. Um, so uh, can I ask the broadcasting to uh, place us in open session now? Yeah. We're in open session. We're in open session now. I want to advise members then that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast to our parent buildings and online. You're welcome to use mobile devices as long as in airplane mode and uh, our, uh, all devices are muted. Um, okay. So number one the item, first item in today's agenda is we have we have a, uh, apologies and we have no apologies. Uh, the uh, second uh, item. Um, well, sorry, Rosemary hasn't joined it, but she was, she'll was be with us very, very shortly. Uh, she was having a technical difficulty with getting online. Um, Rosemary, so, oh, Rosemary, you're very welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Rosemary. Uh, so, Chairperson's Business, I want to ask members to note that I'll be having an informal meeting with some of the officials uh, this afternoon to discuss the provision of papers to the committee. And I want to ask members to note that there are three substantive oral briefings today and time will be tight for us to get finished up for one o'clock. So we need to be as concise uh, as and focused as we can. Uh, draft minutes, I want to refer members to the draft minutes for the meeting on the 4th of March, page seven. Can I seek agreement for the, the draft minutes? Okay. Put these all in the gallery here so we can see he's nodding. And I will sign the minutes whenever I'm uh, back up, up again. Um, most likely uh, next week at some stage. Okay, we're going to move on to item five on our agenda, and um, that's uh, an oral briefing uh, from Minister Poots on his ministerial priorities. I would like at this juncture to welcome by Starleaf Minister Poots, uh, Dan McMahon, the Permanent Secretary, uh, David Small, the Deputy Secretary, Robert Huey, the Head of uh, Veterinary Service and Animal Health, Norman Fulton, Head of Food and Farming Branch and Brian Doherty, Head of Central Services and Contingency Planning. I'd like to invite Minister Poots and his officials to, to brief the committee. Thank you. Can, can you hear me, Mr Chairman? Yes, Mr Poots, and it's great to see you back on post again. I'm glad you feel, um, feel in, in better form to be with us here today. Yes, no, doing well. And, uh, back, well, close to back to my, my, my old self. Still a wee bit to go, but, but, but well on the way there now. But thank, uh, thank yourselves um, and the committee members, indeed, all of you who contacted me over the period. Um, I appreciate your, your good wishes and appreciate the invitation here today to share with you um, on the key priorities for the year ahead. And this will be re reflected in the DERA 21-22 uh, uh, business plan, which will be finalised close to the start of the new reporting year. So clearly many challenges facing the department, not least all those resulting from the UK's exit from the EU. But such challenges also present opportunities for Northern Ireland to play its role on the national and international stage, protecting the environment, growing a vibrant and sustainable Northern Ireland economy. And we're committed to working collaboratively with others to ensure that we take full advantage of these opportunities for the benefit of current and future generations. I'm also acutely aware of the adverse impacts that COVID-19 has had in Northern Ireland and across the world and some of my key priorities the year ahead will focus on helping the people of Northern Ireland recover from the pandemic, and we all have to play our part in what that recovery will look like. 
Northern Ireland is at the heart of a very complex food supply chain that relies on the open and free movement of goods with the rest of the UK. And any disruption in that supply chain has the potential to cause a much more pronounced effect on Northern Ireland's food supply system. To recognise the importance of food supply, my department has developed an agreement with other relevant government departments and the Northern Ireland Executive, an escalation policy and an overall Northern Ireland food supply contingency plan. And we continue to refine current actions to ensure we are best prepared to respond to future food supply security issues. My ambition is for Northern Ireland to be a world-class food region, recognised for its sustainability, quality, safety, authenticity and knowledge-based approach. And DEFRA is in the early stages of exploring with other Northern Ireland departments and interested parties the merits, scope and content of a possible future food strategy framework for Northern Ireland, and this will continue uh, in the year ahead. Departmental officials continue to work uh, with DEFRA to inform the UK's government on trade negotiations. Negotiations with other countries that have a free trade agreement with the EU have made good progress, and for a large majority of these countries, a continuity agreement has been put in place from the 1st of January 2021. Putting in place continuity agreements will enable Northern Ireland to trade directly with these countries in similar terms to now, despite being excluded from EU trade deals. Over the past 12 months, not only have we had to deal with the pandemic, but we also have to navigate a new path as a result of Brexit. Following on from this period of change and transition, now is an opportune time for us all to look uh, the future and identify opportunities to strengthen and grow our agri-food industry in a sustainable way. One of these is the opportunity to develop an agriculture supply framework better suited to local needs, one that will provide for and secure long-term sustainability within our industry. I want to take a few minutes now to say something more on future farming support. My vision for future agriculture in Northern Ireland is to define around four outcomes. An industry that pursues increased productivity as a measure of sustained profitability in international terms, closing the productivity gap, which has been opened up with other major suppliers. An industry that is environmentally sustainable in terms of its impact on and guardianship of air, air quality, soil health, carbon footprint and biodiversity. An industry that displays improved resilience to external shocks such as market and currency volatility, extreme weather events which are ever more frequent and to which the industry has now become very exposed an industry which operates with an integrated, efficient, sustainable, competitive and responsive supply chain with clear market signals and an overriding focus on high quality food and the end consumer. So I've tasked officials to begin a conversation with industry as soon as possible on all areas of future farming support that will deliver against uh, these our outcomes. And looking to the future when it comes to delivering better productivity, environmental performance, resilience and functioning supply chains, I see a role for simplified area-based income support um, with the safety net set at a level which doesn't blunt innovation or productivity. I see a role for coupled support, targeting, for example, suffer cow and breeding new producers. This would not be a return to the old coupled payments of the past. We need to explore how coupled support can be designed to drive better economic and environmental performance and not be just another means of allocating payments to farmers. I see a strong central role for agri-environment that will deliver clear outcomes as we have many issues to address. Our air quality, water quality, biodiversity, soil health, our landscape, these are all heavily influenced by farming and we have to accept that this influence has not always been positive, but the important point is that it can be positive going forward and we will only address our environmental challenges if agriculture and farmers are part of the solution. So moving forward, we must join up our environmental ambitions with farm economic activity. We need to invest time, money and effort in creating and refining our support schemes and tools. Young farmers are the new generation and what you learn and adopt sees the future or sets the future for future careers and in farming and the performance of the industry as a whole. And that's why I see continuing professional development as something that is absolutely vital within farming as we move forward in this new world uh, post EU exit. Finally, it's important to say that I also see a role for succession planning, which has been the age-old problem in agriculture. Moving forward, we have an opportunity to develop an approach to succession, which respects the farmer who is stepping back and assists the younger farmer who is moving forward. And my ultimate aim is to ensure that we take full advantage of the opportunities presented to us now that we have exited the EU to develop a sustainable agriculture industry 
in which all farmers are supported on an equitable basis. Proper consultation is vital, and as such new schemes take time to develop and implement. DERA now has a confirmation of replacement Pillar 1, Pillar 2 and common market organisation funding of £315.6 million, which provides a significant degree of certainty, particularly in relation to direct payments. As you would expect, another major priority for DERA is continuing to undertake mitigating actions to deal with climate change and ensure we protect and enhance the environment for future generations. Although my department has specific responsibilities in relation to the draft PFG for 2021, namely Outcome 2, we live and work sustainably, protecting the environment. Our focus will not solely rest there, as our collaborative work will continue to contribute to most of our other PFG outcomes. For example, our economy is globally competitive, reasonably balanced and carbon neutral, and we all have, uh, we all enjoy long, healthy, active, fulfilled lives. The executive's new decade, new approach document includes a coordinated and strategic approach to the challenge of climate change, with actions to address both the immediate and long-term impacts in a fair and just way, progressing the green growth strategy and the environmental strategy next year which will play a significant role in this. The Green Growth Strategy, which you have previously been briefed on, will be our pathway to achieve our environmental and climate change goals in a way that delivers wider economic and social benefits to the people of Northern Ireland. DERA is leading the development of the Executive's multi-decade Green Growth Strategy in partnership with other departments, local government and stakeholders from across the business and voluntary sectors. We will use the Green Growth Pathway to transform and grow the Northern Ireland economy whilst protecting our natural assets and reducing our carbon emissions. Through tackling climate change together, we can deliver outcomes which will contribute to a resilient recovery through a greener, low carbon and circular economy in Northern Ireland. I have agreed a process for the development of the Green Growth Strategy, which includes a three-phased approach. An initial draft strategy framework will be issued by the 31st of March 2021. Following further stakeholder engagement, a draft strategy will be published in the autumn to align with the UK Climate Change Conference of Parties, COP26, to be held in Glasgow in November 21. Uh, following a public consultation exercise, I expect the Executive's Green Growth Strategy to be put in place for March 2022. The strategy framework document will enable us to engage collaboratively with our key stakeholders in a way which reflects the scale and scope of green growth and climate action. Inextricably linked to this, is our commitment to the continued protection and improvement of the environment, and we will have the freedom but also the responsibility to develop new approaches to replace EU policy. We will have to decide how we report, monitor and set targets. We will also have to look at how we work together with other UK nations, and if nothing else, this will place demands and resources as we move to new ways of working. An environment strategy will set the context in which we do this by establishing an overarching framework for the environment for many years to come. It is anticipated that the Environmental Bill will receive royal assent in autumn 2021. The implementation of this bill, <coughs> along with the work on clean air strategy, ammonia strategy, and proposed plastic reduction action plan, will be progressed by my officials throughout 2021. And as I mentioned at the outset, a key challenge for us all is our recovery pathway from the pandemic. Whilst the current rollout of vaccinations provides some light at the end of the tunnel, um, we're not quite out of the woods yet, so building on the COVID support of 44 million already provided by my department, I will seek additional support as necessary to support the recovery of rural communities and agri-food and fishing industries. So whilst officials are actively looking for avenues to help rural communities recover from COVID-19 restrictions, work will also progress in developing the rural policy framework, which will shape uh, rural uh, priorities in the future. The framework is planned for public consultation later this spring and will cover five key areas. Innovation and entrepreneurship flourish, rural tourism, health and well-being, increased employment opportunities, improved connectivity. Work will also continue on our business as usual work in terms of regulation and enforcement, but I hope this has given you a quick overview of the key departmental priorities for the year ahead. DERA has a diverse portfolio and the challenges are significant in the year ahead. I can assure that through the department officials, we remain committed to delivering the best we can for the people we serve. As I highlighted in my opening statement, DERA's business plan uh, for 2021-22 is nearing completion, and I'll ensure <coughs> that the views of the committee are sought prior to publication. It will set out my department's key targets for the year ahead, provide more details and budget 
and monitoring progress against targets. Again, thanks for the invitation here today, and we're happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Minister Pitts. Um, that was a very uh, wide-ranging report, uh, report overview of your key ministerial priorities. And um, we uh, obviously, there's members are keen to uh, ask uh, some questions of you on it. And I suppose I, I want to just uh, kick off, Minister Pitts. Um, I'll tell you what, what was. I have been um, contacted by by a number of farmers who are unclear about what's going to happen in this incoming year in terms of, of farm support and even in the time ahead. And I'm getting uh, feedback that, you know, there, that there are farmers who are holding off, entered into conacre agreements and other things they got there because of the uncertainty. What would be your advice for farmers in that situation for the year ahead, Minister Pitch? Uh, my advice for farmers and landowners is to, is to proceed and, and do what is right for them in, in the year, year 2021. And uh, not to be not to be trying to second guess things um, for future years. Uh, so I would encourage people to engage if, if they previously had let land, um, and and that is what something what they want to continue doing. Um, that, that is something that they should continue to do, uh, and not seek to try and second guess what might be done or what might not be done, and what impact twenty twenty one might have upon that. Um, I, I, it isn't our intention um, to to use things in a way in, 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 in this particular year um, which will then lock people into to circumstances uh, for many years to come. So so what, what you're saying, Minister Pitts, then, is that this this year uh, won't be treated like a historic reference year, like it had been the case when the single farm payment came in uh, at the, at the, in, the, in, the two, in the 2000s, you know, at the beginning of the uh, 2005, you no, know, no. This, this isn't a direct reference yeah. here. How would you yeah. say? It? That's not not the current intention anyway. Right, and um, Minister, the other thing, uh, see, in relation to, you said that the the rural policy framework will be for public consultation in the spring. Is that right? Yes. And you see the thirty four million pound that has been netted netted. Uh, of the uh, rural uh, rural fund we can't carry over from the the EU time. Has that had any uh, impact on the decision uh, from your department to reallocate, reallocate funding from the the EFS? Okay, can uh, I bring Norman in on, on on the on the funding side of it, the finance side of it? There is um, been a, a few swings and a few roundabouts in all of this. Um, and financially, um, I don't believe that we will be um, any, any worse off uh, or considerably worse off than, than, than where we are now. Uh, but perhaps we bring Norman on the, the stage just to clarify uh, maybe some of the, the, the changes and switches there, there, there has been uh, in the finances and how things are, have, are, are transpiring to work out. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Minister. And Chairman, yes, come back to your, your question about uh, the impact of the, the netting off of 34 million. So that doesn't impact uh, the current rural development programme that runs to completion in 2023. Uh, and the environmental farming scheme is, is part of that programme. Uh, and so we continue to actively manage the uh, resources, the funding within our RDP to ensure that we fully spend out uh, and secure maximum advantage from that programme. So it, it's not having uh, uh, an effect uh, on the EFS uh, and, and, and that program. Uh, what it does do is it, uh, it, it I suppose, puts a, a, a bit more of a limit on what we would otherwise have in terms of new measures, new programs going forward. Uh, but again, we, we manage our way through that. So but it, it doesn't you, impact the current RDP. But has there been a decision to reallocate funding away from the EFS? Um, no, we're actually uh, planning to uh, launch a current uh, EFS uh, uh, tranche, uh, another tranche uh, in April of this year. Um, that'll be the la last one within the current uh, RDP. Um, and then we uh, will probably have another, uh, at least another one uh, after that as well, as we transit from the current agri-environment programme into what would be a uh, our, our replacement for uh, EFS going forward. So we, we always look to that transition to make sure that that is going to be as, as smooth as possible. So um, so within RDP, yes, there's always going to be uh, monies moving around as we ensure that uh, everything is, is fully funded uh, and, and the demands are met within the RDP. 
And uh, and just before I move around the room, just one last uh, uh, point I want to just raise. Um, I wrote to Minister Lyons just recently about this here, uh, your predecessor, uh, Minister Putsch. Um, it was in relation to um, some comments that I'd seen reported uh, recently from dear officials in relation to the, the possibility of any farmer taking on a new business from 2025 will requ be required to have a third level qualification. I just want clarification. When you say third level qualification, not like degree or diploma level, or is it a level three uh, qualification? And also, I had seen the reference to agri insurance being re resurrected again. Now, that had been mentioned in the 2018 discussion document, and I had hoped that it, that had disappeared from the public discourse, but it seemed to have been re resurrected again. Could you tell me, uh, are those two factors something that have been considered in relation to future agriculture policy? Because I do believe that if we were down the line of requiring uh, people to have a third level qualification, that would have a, a negative implication for succession planning because in many uh, families, you know, the, 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 the oldest daughter or son, uh, not the oldest, one or, one or other in the family would, would learn all their trade on the farm and would move down generations that way. So is that something that's been seriously considered in terms of the future uh, agriculture policy? It's uh, certainly not something that which which I have agreed to, um, and certain it's not something which has been brought to me in my, in, in my period as minister. Um, I would imagine that it is level three as opposed to um, third level, or th as opposed to third level, um, which there's a considerable difference to. Uh, mm -hmm. But even at that, um, that would still pose particular challenges for 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 some people. So, um, you know, I I, I know. Um, recently, of a case where, where a young person sought to get into agricultural college, and and they had uh, problems with um, uh, dyslexia at, at, at school, and and consequently didn't didn't get the course that they wished to get. Um, and I don't see that someone like that, who is you know quite capable of developing the the, the, the agricultural skills and all of the practical skills that, that are required, um, should be discriminated against um, in that way. So. We need to be very careful about these things that, that we don't end up in a, in a position which becomes discriminatory. Um, you know, whilst whilst we want to encourage uh, people to, um, you know, participate uh, in agricultural courses because um, we we want to close those gaps that are referred to <clears throat> in terms of efficiency. Um, it is not the be all and end all. Um, um, and we need to ensure that, that equality and fairness um, is at the heart of things. Right. Uh, thank you for that, Minister. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move around the room here. First up for a question is Patsy Malone. Okay, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm online okay there, aye? Patsy, we got you. Yes. That's good. Thanks very much. Um, and first of all, just personally to you, Edwin, I'm delighted to see you back at the at the helm there. Um, you. Good to see your good to see your health well and the men. Um, that's, uh, I'm sure it's very very a great relief to you and your family. So, uh, can I just move on? Uh, there's a number of things. Just uh, I want to focus in first of all on the the rural policy, and I know why this development stages and, and the likes. Could you maybe just give me an insight, please, Minister? as to how the development rollout of that policy will be done in a, a cross-departmental way, because you've already touched on a number of issues there, such as um, levels of education, um, uh, literacy levels, as well as there's a multiplicity of other things, such as local development plans and how they'll work into this, planning policy, infrastructure, and I need some of that infrastructure and connectivity, which you referred to there, is being addressed through the, the project stratum and fibrous are out and about at the moment. So <clears throat> I just wanted some sort of an indication as to how that's anticipated to be done, if you like, cross-departmental, cross-government way, to make sure that, that everyone is buying into it and everyone is, uh, anybody, and health too, obviously, uh, will be a major factor in it as well. Um, I wanted to find out just how that's anticipated is going to be done in a joined-up way <clears throat> so that nobody's left out of the loop and that... Uh, we do get proper rural development policies uh, rolling out. Well, and then, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Uh, you, you, I'll respond to that before, before you go to the next one because you might forget what you, <laughs> one of the questions. <laughs> but uh, in terms of, of uh, 
of working with other departments, um, our, our department prides itself in that. So, for example, um, Project Stratum uh, is being ruled out now, where, where, where um, the installation of, of broad, rural broadband is taking place um, with the Department of Enterprise or the Department for the Economy. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we worked very closely with the Department of Regional uh, Development on the community transport infrastructure to ensure that um, isolated people, particularly vulnerable people, uh, were able to receive uh, medicines and, and, and receive foods. We've always worked extensively with local government uh, in, in the distribution of funding. I worked closely with the Department for Communities, uh, for example, in pulling together a scheme uh, to support businesses that, 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 that made sure that it wasn't just um, the urban uh, businesses that received benefits, uh, but also rural businesses. Um, and uh, we uh, are continuing to work with the Department for Economy uh, on a series of tourism uh, initiatives, um, also in terms of um, the whole um, food, uh, given that the economy has a significant role uh, in terms of the food companies, and we have a, 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 a less significant role on that side, but we have the, the, the role in the primary production. So. You know, what, what our practice has been that, that where we identify that another department um, ha has, a, has a role, maybe a less significant role, um, maybe a more significant role, we, we will work closely with that department uh, to seek to get delivery. And I think that's uh, what um, the executive should be about. It's about working with each other to deliver for all of the people of Northern Ireland. And that's certainly something that, that I remain totally and wholly committed to doing. OK, thanks very much for that, Edwin. Just as a roll on from that, I've just two two other issues to raise. One is the in terms of the policy itself, policy is grand, but policy uh, needs to be backed up with resources. And I'm trying to figure out just um, because we uh, the EQ monies is removed from rural development programs now, and it's anticipated. I think Mr. Colton uh, told us previously it's upwards of uh, 34 million less potentially. Over the next three years, um, how is that going to be substituted for? Because the likes of those, those monies, those rural development programs, were very, very, very effective in supporting communities. And then, last but not least, you'll you'll not be surprised to hear from my um, support for Loch Ness fishermen. It really has become a stage of almost embarrassment now that that uh, funding, that support, hasn't got out there. So uh, I would be uh, glad to hear from you on both of those, please. Well, okay. And in terms of the 34 million, that that was, had never been spent, um, uh, and therefore that isn't money that that people would notice missing, um, because it, it it hadn't hadn't been um, spent year on year. It had been planned to, to spend that 34 million over the course of the next three years, um, so uh, it'll be something that we don't have to spend. However, there has been other um, additional. Um, uh, funding has has come in so um, I think that that we will be able to 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 uh, meet the needs um, and, and and do that in, in a fairly positive way um, commensurate with what has happened uh, heretofore and and hopefully a bit more in terms of the, the Loch Ness um, Eden fishermen I believe that there's a paper um, for me I haven't received it yet since I come back in. It was one of the first questions that I asked was the Loch Ness Eel Fishermen um, uh, compensation or support signed off. Um, it hadn't been, uh, so I, I will seek to get that done um, in the not too distant future. I know I've been saying that for a while, um, but um, I do want to get that out of the way. Okay. Have you any on that at all, Ed? Just please. Um, well, as soon as I get a paper, the, the, the paper up, I, 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 I'll not be hanging around. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Just see the, Minister Pooch, just see the party mentioned Stratum there. I just want to add in, just looking for your support as well. You, you'll know that Stratum covers 76,000 uh, homes or premises in mostly rural areas. There's still around 20,000 that were in the original intervention area, but the, so there's, there, there's, there needs to be um, additional support to, to expand that intervention area. And I know that your colleague, uh, the economy minister, has been engaged with DCMS in Westminster. Is that something maybe you could, uh, your department could add with as well 
to work with DCMS to try and get uh, an ex extension or, a, or some sort of scheme that would expand that intervention area further so we can get as much coverage of broadband as possible as part of this project? Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, perhaps it's, it's an area that we can look at um, with this new connectivity uh, mm -hmm. office that uh, the Prime Minister wants to set up. Um, connectivity, of course, just doesn't apply to, to, to roads and tunnels and bridges. Um, it applies to uh, the sort of uh, means that we are using uh, to communicate with each other today. So uh, that may be a possibility as well. But, you know, as a department, we, we um, are contributing £15 million uh, to Project Stratum. And we're totally committed uh, to ensuring that rural communities um, can engage um, effectively um, in, the, in the virtual um, means because uh, it creates great opportunities uh, to people to live in rural communities. It reduces our environmental footprint uh, and increases productivity. So, so we're all on for that. Thank you, Minister. Uh, William? William? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Loud and clear, William. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I welcome the Minister back after his surgery? And uh, certainly, he's very welcome back, and I know he has a great love for the industry. Um, and I broadly welcome his key, your key ministerial priorities. Uh, I do also welcome the fact that you're looking at some sort of couple support for the sector industry. I think it's very important. Sector in Northern Ireland. Would it be your intention to bring something in in this 21, 2021 scheme year, or is that further ahead? No, um, we, we, we won't get it done um, for this year. Uh, so to properly consult, um, to to work with um, the, the, the sector, um, to to get feedback, um, I think that we will need this year to, to actually work things through. Um, involve some leg legislative uh, amendments and so forth. Um, so we will need this year to, to work things through and uh, hopefully that then would be, pe people will know where they stand at the end of this year um, as they seek to make decisions um, for the 2022 financial year. Edwin, am I right in saying that 2021 direct farm payments will be at the same level as 2020? Is that, is that yes. key? Yes. So in, in, in effect, it would remain to the EU, the EU, we probably would even get less. I think there's a cut in relation to the EU fund. Um, in relation to the protocol, and I don't want to burden you on this, uh, we had uh, one of your, uh, Robert Huey last week said at the moment, uh, during the grace period, there's something like two to 3,000 checks. If that grace period ended, there would then be something between twenty and 30,000 checks. <coughs> Would that not put an intolerable burden on the internal market in the UK totally? Well, we're, we're looking, for example, at staffing. Um, so at this stage, we're, we're potentially looking at um, around 400 staff, um, a very high number of vets being required. Now, I'm not sure where we're going to get these vets um, because there already is a shortage of vets um, in the UK, so I'm not sure where we're going to get them. Um, how we divert them away from from other services? What impact does that have on, on food safety, for example, and other things? And we can't allow that to happen um, because we have high uh, we have high uh, recognition um, across the world for the provenance of our food. And that is because we have quality of checks taking place. So, you know, taking vets out of meat plants, for example, or the chicken factories or the pork factories, um, to check something which, you know, has already been checked by vets, um, has been produced to the same standards uh, as here and the rest of the European Union. Uh, it would be an entirely illogical uh, thing to do uh, and a, a complete waste of, of time and resource. And cause a, a significant addition um, to the cost of bringing food into Northern Ireland and consequently an additional cost to the consumer. So we do need a reality check on all of this. Um, I welcome the extension of the grace period, um, but that 
to some extent just kicks the can down the road. We need people to be realistic about this. And, you know, you were told last week that Northern Ireland would have as many checks as the rest of the EU put together. How, how, how can that be a sensible or rational place? And, you know, for those who were calling for the rigorous implementation of the protocol, well, that's precisely what it is. And that's a consequence of the rigorous implementation of the protocol. And the consequence of that rigorous implementation of the protocol is a massive number of people involved in checks, additional cost to industry, additional cost to consumer, damage to trade and relationships uh, that exist, and significant consequences uh, for business and the consumer in Northern Ireland. And perhaps those who, who um, were calling for the rigorous implementation would like to apologise to the Northern Ireland public and indeed um, send a message to the European Union that they no longer want rigorous implementation because they've seen what it's like and rigorous implementation is going to wreck our economy uh, if we don't address uh, this issue. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, okay. Okay, I'm going to move on around. Uh, Minister, uh, uh, John, John Blair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can, can I start by uh, saying a very sincere welcome back to the Minister. It's good, good to see him. Thanks, John. And uh, also take the opportunity to wish him a full and speedy recovery. I want to pick up uh, on the subject we, we left there, uh, and I'll deal with, with the um, implementation of the protocol. The Minister and other members of this committee will be well aware that some people uh, in my party and other parties were warning of the consequences of a harder Brexit for some years and were accused initially of scaremongering when we predicted what the outcome would be. But on the subject of staff resources, and I'm going to try to move to, to solutions and, and positive moves, um, uh, and, and the subject of, of staff numbers and vets, which is a very, very relevant point uh, as a, as a uh, finite resource. Um, we all know there's been recent publicity. Uh, and uh, subsequent uh, inquiries and legal advice being sought about decisions taken around ports and, and we'll await, await the outcomes. The, the department gave us an assurance last week that um, decisions taken would be within the law. Um, as we move forward, can I ask what progress has been made, if any, on a UK-EU uh, veterinary agreement, which would considerably ease some of the problems that have been highlighted, um, and how DERA is feeding into those discussions and that progress, if any progress is being made. And then, Chair, if I can, I'd like to come to you another question on, on the environment. OK. I'll bring Robert in on, 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 on that question, because he's a man with expertise in that. So, as I said last week, there has been no formal discussion at all yet. The discussions on EU-UK um, Veterinary agreement will, of course, be, be led by the Chief Veterinary Officer for the UK, Christine Middlemas. Um, but I will be closely involved with Christine in that. Uh, we have um, weekly meetings with the Commission um, to, to look at problems both with the, with the Northern Ireland Protocol and with problems um, with GB trading with, with the EU. Uh, and those are very productive meetings. But that hasn't moved on yet uh, in the current environment to discussions about uh, a, a veterinary agreement. A veterinary agreement is a very normal thing within a trade negotiation. And it usually mm. happens, as in this case, after there has been a trade ag agreement, uh, as we get into the details. And my hope is that is where a lot of the, the issues that are causing concern to traders around cattle movement and sheep movements and all the other other issues I'm hoping that that's where that can be dealt with um, through a neg negotiated outcome. The certificates we're talking about, the EHCs, are, are laid out in European law uh, in their detail. Uh, and in my view, the best way of dealing with those is to try and, uh, and talk to the EU at a UK level uh, and, and get those issues sorted out as quickly as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Robert. If I could come back on that very quickly. <clears throat> um, there, there seemed to be a couple of weeks ago, I would say, some indication from the Commission they were prepared to look at this. So are, are we having it clarified that UK government actually haven't raised this in the formal discussions? I can only speak, uh, John, for the meetings that I'm in, uh, which are the, the formal meetings between 
between officials, and it hasn't been discussed there. Um, but whether it's being discussed uh, at cabinet office level between that and yeah. the EU cabinet, I, I just am on sighted, I think is the phrase. Of course, Robert, and thank you for that. That's one uh, for, for all of us to work together to continue to, to uh, pursue. If I could move, um, a chair, chair, to the uh, asking the question to the minister on the um, green growth strategy um, and the environment in, in general. Uh, and I welcome, I've welcomed previously those strategies. I welcome his, his comments on how the environment can, can link to a sustainable economy. And on that theme, can I ask, what um, efforts have already been made or what can be made at this stage to ensure a Green New Deal strategy, a green recovery strategy, which will target uh, green jobs, biodiversity recovery, um, climate change issues as well? And is there an effort being made to, to link in an interdepartmental strategy, a way to tackle and, and reach a Green New Deal? Well, in terms of programme for, for, for government and all of that. Um, we in the in DERA have been pressing um, at all times um, for uh, the, the green economy to be reflected and in, in many aspects it has. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking at renewable energy in Northern Ireland where around 45% of our um, electricity is, is, is produced from renewable means. Um, the, the renewable heat uh, is, is an issue which has caused all sorts of problems that um, I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll get into today. Uh, but again, that is an area where if the RHI um, uh, that we currently have is done away with, um, then uh, we need to uh, ensure that there is something to replace it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I should say that the, the current funding for RHI is not commensurate with, with, with what is required at all. Uh, and uh, the, the people who have um, invested in that equipment um, have been badly hurt um, as a consequence of making that investment. And there was a very modest uplift offered um, through the Bugmas report. And that at least should be adhered to um, quickly, in my view, by, by the executive, uh, if they are genu genuinely committed um, to ensuring uh, that the renewable uh, energy sources are, are maximised. Uh, but in terms of a, of a whole series of things, we need to look, <clears throat> for example, at the opportunities for hydrogen and um, for capturing hydrogen from um, a lot of those um, wind energy sources, for example, um, from waste energy sources uh, and from other places. How we can use the existing um, gas infrastructure network to distribute that hydrogen uh, and there are so many opportunities to gain to be working uh, with other parts of government. And so, you know, Translink, for example, have, have, have been um, looking at, at hydrogen buses. Um, that's, a, that's an area, and they've acquired hydrogen buses. That's an area that we need to be working to develop. Um, and I think Northern Ireland can be one of the leading places anywhere in the world in terms of the development of hydrogen. Um, another course of th uh, that, that I want to look at and have um, corresponded with the, the DFI minister uh, is on the issue of charging points for, for electric vehicles. Um, you know, we've been told that we're doing away with diesel and petrol cars, uh, so uh, you know people will, will, will be buying electric cars uh, and won't have an option uh, in the not too distant future uh, if they want to buy a new car. We, we must must get an infrastructure in place that supports that because the current charging points are pathetic. They were done, you know, I was involved whenever we done that in 2010. We are in a wholly different place in 2021 than we were in 2010. A lot of those charging points aren't even working effectively. So yeah. it is critical um, that our department and the Department for Infrastructure uh, work closely together uh, to ensure the rollout. Uh, of this, and that may also in, in, involve the Department for Economy uh, in terms of um, uh, energy re regulation and all of that. So, you know, there are so many areas, uh, John, where we can genuinely work together on, on developing um, green growth. Um, the, the Department for Economy is, is, is working closely with us on it. Um, we look at the whole area in terms of Department for Communities and the opportunity to retrofit housing, and um, particularly rural housing. Uh, a lot of 
um, old stone houses, um, which d don't hold heat well and all of that there, uh, people living in damp conditions and all of that, we can have a much better outcome for, for all of our citizens and, and also have a much better outcome uh, for our environment and, and develop a win-win situation out of this. This shouldn't be perceived negatively. I thank the Minister for that, Chair. I know there were very good points about the, the lack of infrastructure for uh, green initiatives in rural areas. And members here who represent rural constituencies would be mindful if they had an electric car and were on a long constituency journey and the battery was low, it could create very practical, very real difficulties. Um, uh, on, the, on, that, on that subject of improving infrastructure and also trying to harness the innovations that are out there, um, could I say then, if it, even a little bit cheekily, that if, if we came knocking at the Minister's door for an interdepartmental green recovery fund, that door would not be closed in Dara? Um, I, I, I rule nothing and rule nothing out at this stage, John. So, so yeah. w w uh, everyone has to be value based, but but yeah. w w w wouldn't be wouldn't be uh, initially saying that that's that's something we be opposed to at all. Okay, thanks for all of that. Okay, thank you, uh, John. Uh, Harry, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Minister. we um, are thankful for your recovery and thanks for attending today, Minister. What are your plans for future support? For productive farmers, a couple of wee questions, just yeah. Well, in terms of a productivity is key. Um, so we want to have efficient, productive farms because they're they're also uh, the farms which which very often are um, providing environmental benefits because they they produce you know, a high level of proteins um, mm -hmm. for 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 the consumer. Uh, and they're doing it in a very efficient way. Uh, so we want to ensure that that that, that productivity um, is supported and, and people can become ever more efficient in terms of, of, of what they deliver. And, you know, that may may see us over the course of the next number of years um, reducing the length of time that animals spend on farms and so forth um, because we get um, a, a better productivity. So, and what we do in, in farm support, it, it shouldn't just be, here's 300 million and we'll just spread that jam all around as, as best as we can. It, it should be more targeted. It should be more focused. Um, I want to see, you know, suckler cows, uh, for example, having high progeny uh, bulls being used and, and, and consequently uh, the calves of higher uh, growth rates. Um, exactly. bit better confirmation and all of that uh, so they actually meet the, the, the market's requirements uh, and we need to encourage farmers just not to produce something that, that they want to produce and then find a market for it uh, we need to encourage farmers to identify uh, the markets and produce to what the market actually needs and that's perhaps where the success of the chicken industry has been uh, mm -hmm. where the, they are very market focused and, and produce um, goods with, which are um, wanted by that market uh, and we need to have all of all of farming in that place and primary producers in that place uh, so <clears throat> there's a significant course of work to be done uh, obviously the envelope isn't bigger um, so we need to work um, with the sector we need to work with yourselves um, uh, and identify how best that envelope can be spread uh, to make sure that we get the most effective use of that money and this isn't about you know taking something away from someone uh, it's about ensuring that uh, people who are delivering actually um, get something for that uh, on the other side it's important uh, that we support those um, who are making those environmental steps and if we are to continue to have this um, high level of production of agri-food in Northern Ireland we're going to have to do it in an environmentally sustainable way and that will involve um, changes in, in, in some of our current practices. Uh, it will involve ensuring that um, <clears throat> our peatlands are um, optimised and, and therefore the drying out of peatlands that has taken place over a period, um, that needs to be changed. Um, some places uh, we're looking at overgrazing, some places we're looking at undergrazing. So there's yeah. too many opportunities for us to address and ensure that we have that highly productive um, environmentally friendly friendly farming system uh, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. 
And Minister, do you have any plans for an NI brand and how we can like promote our high quality agri food product? Well, <clears throat> in some senses, we're, we're being forced down that way as a result of, of, of the protocol uh, because of the, the, the tagging system and that that's, uh, that's being imposed upon us. Uh, but in terms of brand NI, um, um, we're, we're not Scotland, uh, we're not Ireland in that respect either, um, and we're not, not, not UK in that respect. We do, have, we do have something which is different. And uh, to that end, you know, we, we, we should be ensuring that we have um, the highest quality in all aspects of what we're producing. And, and sell it as a house quality because NI can be a niche. Um, NI can sell uh, to the EU, which, which the rest of, of, of the, the UK will struggle to do. NI can also sell to the UK in a way which the EU will struggle to do. So we, we are in a position where marketing Northern Ireland produce um, is something which, which we, we, we can benefit from. Okay. And demonstrating the quality of the produce that we have, and, and we should we shouldn't shy away from this. We have the best quality produce any anywhere in the world, and we should and, and, and we should be proud of what we're doing, and proud of what we're producing, uh, and we should not be afraid to go out and sell that product, be it in Europe, be it in, uh, in the UK, be it in the rest of the world, and take the advantages that, that exist out there uh, for us. Yep, good. And just to finish, Minister, quickly, could you update the committee on the TB policy? And that's me, thank you. Yeah, um, the TB uh, business case for, for um, a new TB strategy is, 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 has now been done. Uh, it is passing through the final uh, economist. It, it is my intention uh, to publicly consult on a, on a TB strategy um, in uh, the spring of this year. So that that we will be moving to that uh, stage quite quickly now okay. and uh that that is that is good that we've got to that point um it has been taking a bit of a while to get here uh, but nonetheless uh, it is critically important critically important that we reduce the spend on tb um you know we can't keep forking out 40 million pounds of public money every year in tb we we'll have to do something better and we can do something better. And it is entirely wrong that we are slaughtering so many animals yeah. with TB, uh, which is uh, avoidable. Uh, and consequently, um, I would hope that we will have a strategy that will have buy-in from uh, the, the agri sector. I would trust that it will have buy-in from the environmental sector because we will have a healthier wildlife population when we have completed this as well. Yes. Uh, and that is good news for the environment. Um, so I would hope that we will have widespread buy-in on this and that we can move forward um, to the benefit of, of, of the taxpayer, of the farmer, and indeed of the environment. Exactly. Yep. Thank you, Minister, and thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, th thank you, um, Minister. I uh, have to say I'm glad that you sort of acknowledged the benefits of the protocol there, but our ability to have access to the rest of the EU while uh, Britain will struggle to have that access? I, I, I've never been shy, shy, shy in, in acknowledging that. What, what I would say, Declan, Declan or Mr Chairman, <laughs> it's a bit like a football match uh, and you, you, you score a wonder goal in the football match. That, that, that is the benefit of the protocol, uh, but you get hammered 6-1. So, so <laughs> nobody's talking about the wonder goal. They're, they're talking about the bad, bad, bad defeat at the match. I, I don't know what, what the numbers would be in Gaelic terms, but exactly <laughs> that, uh, I, I hadn't thought about that one before. Your benefit, you know? I think there was a few penalties <laughs> on the way too. The bit, the bit, the bit of football being played. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm going to move across to County Fermanagh here now to Rosemary Barton. Rosemary. Rosemary. Can you get Project Stratum down to Fermanagh quickly, so what hey? Yeah. Can you hear me? It's the, it's the South Toronto people taking it in first. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go to Morris next and then I'll come back to Rosemary whenever she gets back online. Morris? 
Morris, can you get in? Okay, we'll move on to South Belfast. Claire? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, okay. We can move back to Rosemary and Morris, Claire, uh, once. Uh, you, you are going there now, Claire? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and um, it's really good to see you back again, and I'm glad to see that you've made a, a quick recovery, and I never doubted it. So well done, and I hope you continue to recover well. Um, I want to look at um, the horticulture sector, if possible. You mentioned the COVID support schemes um, in particular. Um, and I'm wondering, I know that during the week, I think, or recently, you've met with the ornamental horticulture industry reps. And I wonder if you could let us know who it was that you met with um, and if um, requests for any additional compensation schemes were made um, and if they would be made available. And if you could let us know when the current eight applications or 10, is it? I'm not sure, should expect some sort of payment. Because by my estimates, I think that you know um, you had allocated 1.6 million um, to, to cover the COVID finance scheme for the sector. And by my calculations, and I could be wrong, um, with the current applications, only 300,000 of that will be spent. Oh, okay. I think it's the FHA that we met, um, Federation of um, Horticulture. Um, I'm not sure what the other word word is that they have in the, in the title, but uh, it was a representative body of, of the, the well, uh, probably not all of all, all of people all of the people who are involved in it, but but it's a representative body of horticulture in any event, and they raised the issues which I assume why the, the wider. Um, horticulturists would would want to be raised, um, so <clears throat> th those issues are raised th that were raised were around the compensation um, or the support packages uh, for last year. Uh, so letters of offer, I believe, will go out this week or, or sorry next week um, on that, and uh, there was an apology from Dara uh, to them in that it had taken longer, it had been a bit more trickier than, than what they thought, and taken a bit longer to get it ready. Uh, but we are in the position now to, to put out letters of offer and hopefully make payments in, in March of this year, which, which will, will be of some benefit. Um, secondly, uh, they, they discussed the issues around the importation of goods um, from uh, Great Britain. And certainly uh, the, the move last week, towards the end of last week, was beneficial uh, in terms of issues around, for example, bulbs and, and various other items. Uh, but we still have uh, outstanding issues um, around the importation of trees, of hedging, um, a lot of those bare root plants. And, uh, you know, I just think it's a ridiculous thing that uh, if someone wants to plant a hedge in um, Georgian and County Tyrone are, are plant trees uh, in the moors in County Down um, that they can't uh, bring that material in currently which is 20-30 miles away uh, in, in uh, Lancashire just across the sea in Cumbria you know uh, that, that is a ridiculous position that we're in so we do need to, to work on that and the horticulturists want us to work on that and, and that, that is a course of work uh, that we will continue to engage uh, 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 with with them on, the the third major issue that they raised with us is the, the, their need to actually start selling again this year, and of the inequality that exists currently uh, between them and supermarkets and um, you know the, the the filling stations and, and uh, the the hardware stores and all of these other places, and um, what's are selling plants and they can't sell them, and. They, they point out quite rightly, um, you know, their facilities are open air, um, large spaces, low footfall, and there is no good reason whatsoever um, as the COVID rates are falling, from, you know, in, in sizable numbers, as the vaccination is, is, is ruled out, you know, in a very, very successful way, there is no good reason uh, to keep these places closed. And in fact, it is actually safer to, to acquire plants and acquire flowers in a setting like that than it would be in a, in a supermarket where there is, is literally thousands of people uh, passing through them um, on a weekly basis, handling over things, setting them down and all of that there. 
So we, you know, they're making the case, and, and I support their case, um, that they can distribute this material in a much safer way uh, th than others. And uh, I find it deeply regrettable that, that this wasn't resolved before Mothering Sunday. Uh, and I trust that it will be resolved um, by the executive next week uh, in a positive way. And I'd certainly be arguing for it. Thanks very much for that. Can I go back to the, um, the, the funding allocation, Minister, if possible? I mean, uh, uh, is it correct that um, 1.3 million of the allocated budget will be unused for that sector? And if that is the case, what's being done to make sure that those who have not been able to avail of any um, financial assistance will be able to, to do that? I, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll bring um, probably Norman, but, but whichever official is, is most appropriate um, <clears throat> on this. What, what I'd say is that we want to, to support um, whatever the loss happens to be. Uh, and if the loss isn't the 1.6 million, it's something less than that, well, you know, we want to support them to, to, to the, the, the extent of their loss uh, and compensate them appropriately for that. And, you know, do it in as comprehensive a way as possible. I, I don't let on, uh, Claire, that, that we can compensate everybody for every penny of loss that, that, that happened, but, but I want to ensure that we, we encompass as many people as possible um, with as close to the loss as possible. Um, that, 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 that is what we're setting out to achieve. So um, what's official is best place maybe to respond to this? Yeah, Minister, if maybe I come in here uh, on this one. Um, so yes, I mean, the original estimate of uh, what uh, might be claimed uh, from uh, the uh, ornamental horticulture sector was based on our estimate of around about, I think, 40, 50 businesses um, in the event only eight uh, actually came forward with, with valid claims. Um, so that uh, was an estimate. It wasn't a ring-fenced sum. So obviously, if that money uh, is not being used there, it then effectively can be used uh, to address other pressures uh, that, that have emerged in other sectors. Uh, and so, for example, uh, Letters of Offer will be going out uh, next week to deal with uh, some of the issues in the pig sector. Uh, uh, as, an, as an example, uh, hatching eggs, uh, organic milk. Uh, so, it, it's, as the Minister said, it's about addressing the identified losses. Uh, so, we, we, did, we never had a, a ring-fenced budget per se for any given sector. Uh, we had an overall sum of money that we've used to try and address the pressures as they have emerged. Thanks. So I just wanted to just put on record. So we're hearing that there were 40, 50 um, businesses in the sector that um, are out there, but only eight to 10, you know, they came forward and met the high threshold of evidence to avail of the scheme. So that tells us that there are a lot out there who can't meet the high threshold that was um, set to, to put a claim in. So I do believe that, you know, we would urge maybe or ask of the department to maybe look at that and see what can be done to try and, and not let those other businesses fall through the, the cracks there because they do need assistance and they've been impacted as well. But I want to maybe move on. Minister, you're talking to us today about your priorities for the time ahead. And I know we've heard um, from yourself and the department over the time about the strategies coming forward in the priority areas. So we're hearing about an agriculture strategy, the environment strategy, ammonia strategy, the green growth strategy. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you have a, a timeline for when we will be able to see these strategies? Well, clear, clearly we've got a very tight timeline to, to get a lot of this work done, Claire, because there's an election and we'll all be, we'll all be signing off with this time next year to go and fight it. Uh, so, you know, we want to do the climate change bill, for example, and, and that's something which, you know, we need to make significant progress on quickly. Um, officials thought it would be very challenging and, and I, I've insisted that it needs to be done and, and we need to achieve it. Um, we obviously have work that needs to be done for, for COP26 um, so that Northern Ireland can demonstrate, you know, what its contribution is, is, is going to be. Uh, so all of these things need, need, need to, to pull together. Uh, the ammonia strategy um, is, is coming on well. Um, there's a series series of them we're, we're making significant progress on, and I'd be very happy to provide the committee in a written form an update um, just of where progress currently is and the timeline that we're aiming for uh, so that, that we all have it in black and white in front of us um, as to what our aims and goals are in delivering on these strategies. 
Greengrove's is probably going to be closer to um, this time next year before we'll have everything finalised, but it will set a template um, for, 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 for the, the, the new uh, assembly coming in. That would be very much appreciated, Minister, if, if we could be updated. i um, be very keen to have a look at them myself. Thanks. And maybe the last thing I want to address is um, the energy governance for the Northern Ireland any energy transition. They produced their final report and it's just been published. Now, as you'd be well aware more than myself that that was commissioned and funded by the executive. Um, and I'm wondering if you could let us know your thoughts around the recommendations. I think there was four key recommendations, but one of those was also um, the recommendation that a new department for climate and energy transition be established. Has there been any discussion about that and, and how do you feel maybe and what's your thoughts around the establishment of such a department? I'm not aware of that happening in, in my absence and why is it national government uh, level uh, that would be entirely reasonable um, given uh, that we are a regional assembly and <clears throat> we have less resources um, established in a single department for that um, would, would be a significant challenge. Um, and DERA clearly has a, a, a lead function on this um, and, and will very happily give that leadership uh, in terms of the whole um, climate change policy and identifying uh, the areas of concern, um, identifying to other departments uh, what we should be doing. Um, so clearly we've set up the, the, the Green Growth Strategy team and that involves the other departments, and I thank them for, for, for getting involved. Uh, but we can have a course of work um, over this next year in particular, which will draw all of the departments in and identifying you know, what, we, what we need of them, what we expect of them. Um, clearly, we have made significant progress uh, in energy. Um, we can make further progress. I know the Department for Economy is looking at 70% renewable energy. Um, and that's that I believe is entirely achievable. I believe that in the longer term we, we, we can actually get to the point of exporting renewable energy and I think that's the place where, where we, we should want to be. Um, but uh, we will work closely with other departments in this. It's an executive decision if it, want, if it wants to establish another department um, and it's uh, as opposed to myself uh, and you know that's that's a significant call to make. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, thank you. Um, can move can we move back now to Morris? Morris, are you online here with us? I am chair. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Morris. Sorry right about that. I get cut off just for ask a question. Uh, all right. We've seen you coming through this. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, can I can I join with everybody else in welcoming the, the minister back? Uh, Edwin, you're you're looking well, and I wish you a speedy recovery back to full health and fitness. Uh, but Minister, you mentioned scoring a wonder goal in relation to the protocol. But we are a country that has not 05 percent of a population in the EU, yet is responsible for around a fifth of all checks across the EU. I think averaging at the minute we were told last week two thousand, uh, rising to thirty thousand at the end of the grace period. How inflexible are the EU on necessary changes to protocol? And how reluctant, how reluctant are the EU to reach workable solutions? Well, as part of the protocol, um, the Joint National uh, Committee, um, the JNCC, mm -hmm. uh, was to oversee the smooth transition. So let's be very clear. The JNCC, be that EU or be that UK, um, are, are, are both of them combined. But the JNCC has failed. Failed to deliver a smooth transition. So let us not take any responsibility for a failure of the delivery of the protocol, because the failure lies with the JNCC. What is being imposed upon Northern Ireland is irrational, it is oppressive, it is burdensome, mm -hmm. uh, and is actually, frankly, ridiculous. Uh, and you've given figures there uh, for what is being expected of Northern Ireland vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is happening in the rest of the EU. No, nobody can justify that. Nobody can frankly justify what is being asked of Northern Ireland. 
the, the costs, the burdens, the imposition upon consumers is entirely unnecessary. Now, I, I listen to what people say, and, and, and I hear Colin Eastwood, for example, the leader of the SDLP, says there has to be checks somewhere, uh, and, and this is where the checks are going to be. But does there have to be these checks? Mm -hmm. And I pose that question to everybody and to the European Union, does there have to be these checks? Because ultimately what this is about, and what it should be about, and what I thought was what, what they indicated at the outset what it was about, was about stopping um, goods which didn't meet EU standards meeting uh, entering the European Union. Now, if they want us to ensure that goods that's produced in Great Britain doesn't enter the European Union, and to that to happen at the port of Belfast and Larne, for example, and the other ports and airports. Well, that's one thing. But what in the name of goodness has that got to do with a pizza that's ending up on somebody's um, table in Belfast? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, other items of food that's brought in. And, and I know that the Belfast Telegraph, and indeed a, a member of the Lance Party, try, tried to, to, to make fun uh, whenever I talked about the jelly and gravy. I challenge anybody to go into their larder and lift out all of the products in their larder and identify where they come from. And they'll find that virtually all of the products in their larder are produced in Great Britain. So your Hartleys and your HPs and your Heinzes and your Roundtrees and your Cabdrees, and, and there's just so many of these big companies, but they're based in Britain. And they are an essential part of the, the food that the people in Northern Ireland eat. And we cannot have a circumstance or a situation where this goods is going through a whole series of unnecessary checks and as a, as a, as a, as a, as a consequence of that, the cost of food goes up in Northern Ireland by what, 10%, 20%, 30%, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do know that it's going to add a significant uplift in food costs in Northern Ireland. That would be grossly unfair. And why do the European Union want to impose that upon the people of Northern Ireland? Why do they want to create a circumstance where the peace process is damaged as a consequence of what they're doing? Where people who were bought, brought to a place uh, in 1998 are now saying they're not in that place anymore as a consequence of this protocol. Does the European Union want to destroy the peace process that exists in Northern Ireland? Mm -hmm. These are fundamental questions. And we will cooperate, let me be very clear, we will cooperate with the European Union in protecting their single market. That is not an issue. But what is being imposed upon us goes way beyond protecting the single market and the damage and consequences are, 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 are not just significant. They're, they're absolutely kamikaze in what they're doing to Northern Ireland. And the European Union needs to reflect. It needs to draw back and it needs to properly work in the JNCC UK shouldn't have had to make the unilateral decision because the JNCC should have saw this coming and coming very quickly. We have, you know, raised the issue over and over again with them that this supermarket grace period um, at the 1st of April wasn't sustainable uh, and it needed to be extended, but they chose to ignore it. And why are they ignoring the needs of the people of Northern Ireland and the need to reflect upon that themselves and have that reality check? Thank you, Minister. Minister, this is only an opinion, and I, I don't want you to answer it, uh, but in my opinion, the EU are using Northern Ireland as a bargaining tool uh, against future negotiations with the with the UK, and uh, they're punishing the UK for leaving the EU through Northern Ireland. That's only my opinion. Please don't answer it. Uh, Minister, how can Northern Ireland explore the need uh, to uh, support our own internal market uh, with our local retailers using produce, produce produced here in Northern Ireland as opposed to importing cheaper goods of a lesser quality? Well, I think there's many opportunities. And, you know, uh, w w one of the things that happened, for example, was that one of the major supermarkets, which was importing, you know, liquid milk here, is, is, is now acquiring the liquid milk locally. Uh, so, you know, we should be encouraging these things to happen. Um, we should be encouraging it, whether it be through government departments, education, all of that there. Um, and indeed the suppliers who supply the schools and the hospitals and to, 
the prisons and, 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 and those key areas, uh, that they're obtaining as much goods uh, from Northern Ireland PLC as possible. Uh, in, in some respects, um, the protocol has, has, has driven them down that route. Um, um, so so the, 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 they're, it is easier for them to obtain goods um, directly here in Northern Ireland um, than maybe uh, through some of the big distribution networks um, that they had previously set up um, across the UK. Uh, but it's certainly an area where, where we should encourage every government department um, to proactively uh, engage in acquiring goods as locally as possible. It's not just good for, for the, the local community, um, it's good for the environment. And again, so, some of the EU, EU rules um, that were around uh, in terms of procurement um, were quite prohibitive in this, and we need to uh, ensure that any flexibilities that have came about as a result of stepping uh, back from the European Union in terms of procurement, uh, that we ensure those flexibilities are, are built in and to, ensure, to, to allow our people uh, to acquire more goods at a local level. Thank you. Chairman, with your indulgence, one we quickly, if it's possible, if not, and move on. Uh, go ahead, quick one. <laughs> quick one, Minister. Uh, we discussed the climate change bill last week. Uh, could you... Tell us, is there an update on a peatland strategy to manage and restore our natural peatlands? Uh, again, I'll, I'll put that out with, with the response you give to Claire mm -hmm. uh, and give you something in writing on where we are with all of these things. But a, a peatland strategy is, is critical to the whole climate change piece and, it, and it's, a, it's a course of work that we are, are endeavouring on. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, okay we're going to try and reconnect with Rosemary. Can you get us now, Rosemary? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you, Rosemary. Yeah, thank you. Minister, good to see you back again, and I wish you well with your continuing recovery. Thank you. Uh, Minister, a couple, couple of questions. A few things have been asked, but there's one or two other issues. In relation to succession planning, uh, in, in relation to young farmers, obviously when the younger generation take over in a farm, uh, they're keen to progress, improve. They may not have the collateral to do so. What, what uh, talks have you had with banks in relation to supporting young farmers? Okay, Rosemary, thanks for that. We've had a series of meetings with banks. Um, you know, to, to be perfectly honest, they, they haven't focused particularly on young farmers. It, it has been more around um, the, the issues around COVID, about... Um, about future farming needs and all of that. The banks remain relatively positive in terms of farming. Um, farming has been something which has um, proven to be consistent. It's probably not a big one of their big profit makers, um, but it's one of those consistent things uh, that is very reliable for them. And uh, they have, um, th 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 they're working quite closely with the farming community in many areas. So one of the areas where the, the banks, you know, have been working with younger farmers in particular would be in on the chicken production and, and the development of some of the, the, those uh, uh, chicken units, uh, which has enabled young people to stay at home, uh, particularly in areas, you know, th there's been a massive e extension of that in, in your own constituency in South Stirling, for example. And there's a lot of people in, in geese and farming as a result of the chicken industry who wouldn't otherwise have been able to remain on farming because they just didn't have the, the land asset um, to, 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 to you know, sustainably raise a family. So we will continue to work with banks and, and on that issue of uh, encouraging uh, succession planning. I think it involves banks, uh, it involves policy. Um, so looking at the potential for developing um, taxation policies which um, are favourable towards long-term leasing of land as opposed to Conacre and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we have written to um, HMRC on that issue. Um, so there's a series of things that, that we can do uh, to encourage um, success in farming. Um, I think it's absolutely critical if that's the case. I'm not sure what the average age is now. I think it's maybe 59 um, for, for farming. So we do need to continue to drive the, the age of that uh, industry downwards. Uh, it is a bit exaggerated because a lot of people continue to part-time farm whenever they're retired because that's what they want to do. Um, and there are quite a lot of younger farmers. 
uh, but we need to uh, bring more young people into the industry. No, no, nothing survives uh, without the replenishment of youth, uh, and and it's important uh, for the agri food sector. If that's the case. Yeah. Thank you, Minister, for that. Thank you. Um, secondly, you spoke about uh, wind energy and, you know, obviously your plans for the future in relation to your green growth strategy and driving it. Have, has any consideration been given to improving the electricity network? Because I know over the years when we had, uh, we, when we, wind energy was discussed here in Fermanagh, the issue was getting it into the grid. Yeah. And bring it forth. Is there any plans for upgrading the grid, particularly in the west of the province? Uh, yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Rosemary. Um, um, this takes me back to when I was in DOE previously. <clears throat> you know, we identified quite clearly that um, the greatest sources for wind energy w w were in, in County Tyrone, for example, but also of the west of the province in general. Um, but the big electricity distribution was taking place in the east of the province. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was going to cost something like half a billion to bring it to Tandragee, um, to the, 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 that big distribution uh, network that exists there. Um, we also have the necessity for a north-south interconnector, uh, and that's something which, which I'm supportive of and hope that um, we can move to a situation where, where, where that can be moved onwards and, and give us uh, that energy security. Um, and greater energy security as a consequence of that. It's uh, out with my department. It's, it is the Department for Economy in the main that will be yeah. will be looking after this. Um, but your, your point on having the tran transmission system um, to carry the energy it's produced is, is critically important. Um, but it's also an opportunity. Um, you know, there are some companies which um, are very energy intensive, and you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to see some of those companies established in the west of the province and, you know, developing significant job opportunities in the west of the province where the energy happens to be, you know, the available energy. And uh, we should seek to take advantage um, of that as well and encouraging people to actually locate uh, in places where there is extensive availability of renewable energy in terms of business. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister, just one, la one last question. I think we can't leave it. And that is to do with the loan uh, that uh, my colleague has been talking about. Uh, yeah, you put out a statement last night which suggested that there was no problem in relation to bringing loan over to Northern Ireland. Yet, there have been there are emails from your department stating that the composition and technical specification for loan uh, comes under Annex 5 of the EU Commission and further stating very clearly that I regret to inform you that the importation of these products from GB as a third country into Northern Ireland is currently prohibited. So I'm wondering, I'm not saying your statement's wrong, but which is, is there an issue or is there confusion? Could you uh, clarify it, please? Uh, oh, sorry, Rosemary, can you just repeat that there? The, the, the last question there. It's in relation to loam. Yes. Loam, that is the soil. I use the word soil very loosely. Soil that's used for cricket pitches. And there was, there has been confusion. Um, earlier in the week, some of the, the DERA officials said, I regret to inform you that importation of these products from Great Britain as a third country into Northern Ireland is currently prohibited. Yet the minister yesterday put out a statement saying that this was not the case, that it was fine to import the loan. And I'm just af asking minister if you would clear up the confusion. Okay, I I'll clear up any confusion or hopefully clear it up. Um, I became aware of this issue yesterday morning. Um, we, you know, I activated things and got the, the key people uh, involved in it. Um, on, on investigation, it is identified that, that this loam is probably around 70% clay and, and, and sand based beyond that. Uh, so it isn't something um, which meets the requirements of SPS and consequently 
um, at a senior departmental level in conjunction with myself, we were able to make a decision that this would not require SPS checks. So uh, an official may have, have, have given an initial uh, position. I'm giving the departmental position mm -hmm. and the departmental position uh, that we can import Surrey loam, um, which now comes from three counties, but it is particular. Uh, it is a loam uh, soil that, that is produced particular to that area um, and is exported throughout the European Union. Um, I'm giving the position of uh, DERA on this. We don't have an issue with the import of the loam. And as a consequence of it, um, the cricket clubs will be able to, to use that um, in the latter part of the year um, whenever they start to, to, to replace um, the damage that has been done as a result of a season's cricket. Um, it will reduce their costs, it will keep cricket safer and uh, 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 allow people to engage in that sport. I, I know that it's a very English sport, but Declan's former leader, the late Martin McGuinness, was a great fan of cricket. And uh, and uh, I know that it is a sport that, that many people right across the province, right across the community, uh, continue to enjoy. Thank you, Minister, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, he was, and was widely played across North Throne, Dunhamana. And yes, really in the right there, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move across now to Philip up in North Antrim. Thank you, Declan. I just remembering my uh, misspent days as a student watching one day uh, cricket matches uh, when I should have been studying for exams. But anyway, Minister, it is genuinely uh, good to see you back uh, and, and looking well. Uh, and I wish you, like everybody else has said, uh, a continued good recovery and good health. Uh, as well as looking well, it's clear your uh, your bullish nature hasn't been diminished, uh, nope. Minister. Uh, no, nor nor your sense of irony. Uh, and I do have to pull you up uh, on a few things in relation to Brexit. Thank you, thank you Philip. <laughs> I mean, I, I appreciate uh, your your attempts at deflection uh, and blame to everybody uh, from the, uh, the Belfast Telegraph, the Alliance Party, the EU, uh, and seeking apologies from others. I mean, I do think it, it is important that that it's again put in record that, that I mean, Brexit was pursued by the British Tory Party and supported by yourself uh, and your party uh, minister, and, and indeed. Even after the referendum result, uh, the DUP continued to push for as hard a hard a Brexit as possible. Uh, I mean, and that's why there are uh, potential issues today, uh, all resulting from the decision uh, of Brexit. So I, I think it's important that you know that that position is put on record. In terms of your presentation, Minister, I mean, uh, uh, there's. Clearly, uh, a lot of priorities tried are that we need to get through uh, this side of the the, the election. Uh, climate uh, bill and green growth. I mean, I, I've had this discussion with officials and yourself at various points in terms of you know w which comes first. Uh, you know, climate act or bill and targets, and then the strategies falling under that. I mean, from you, you seem to be sensing that everything in terms of climate is going to be pursued through the green growth strategy. I, I'm just not sure how that works in absence of proper targets. I mean, and I would take this opportunity, uh, Minister, to ask for ambitious targets in climate, any climate bill that comes forward. I mean, I do think that, I mean, we, we had a presentation last week where it's clear that the North uh, potentially isn't going to set net zero, but just contribute to an, uh, a bigger net zero. I mean, I would be asking that, that we have ambitious targets here, that they are net zero, that we push to get net zero as quickly as possible. So, I mean, I, you know, I know you've said to Claire that you intend to give us a timetable of all these strategies. You know, I'm making the appeal that all of those strategies need to be subsumed under a uh, uh, an ambitious climate act, and then just finally, uh, or substance to that, in terms of you know other environmental uh, issues. I mean, you talked about the plastic reduction action plan. I mean, you, you will hopefully be aware. I, I have a private members bill on single use ban on single use plastics. I think that's something that we need. Also, it would be useful to get an update on uh, any potential deposit return scheme, Minister. Okay, there's, there's quite a lot there, Philip, and. Uh, uh, Thank you, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I've, I've I've come back just as bullish <laughs> as, as ever. So 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 they didn't they didn't remove that from me whenever they removed from the kidney. So, thankfully, but anyway, um, in terms of the whole climate change issue, um, I actually think 
um, as things are panning out, not as not as it's planned, but as they're panning out, we will probably be reaching um, the full development of green growth strategy, um, almost in conjunction with um, the conclusion of the climate change legislation. So the two things will will come, you know, in the early part of twenty twenty two, um, uh, and th that is fine because <coughs> the, the the legislation will, will set the policy. Uh, and the green growth strategy will be the, the engine to deliver that policy. Um, so, uh, you know, if if, if it was a, a car, um, the, the the legislation will, will will be the shell of the car, and and the, the green growth strategy will be be that engine and drive and and gearbox of the car, which which will actually make the thing move. So, uh, hopefully, those things um, will come uh, in a coordinated way as, as planned. Uh, and will put us in a, in a really strong position to deliver um, on these issues. In terms of the setting of targets, uh, we have been seeking advice from the Climate Change Committee um, on that. Uh, it'll be uh, for a discussion for the committee, for the Assembly um, and the Department. Um, we, we have indicated what the recommendation from the Climate Change Committee happens to be. These are people who are engaged in, in, in this in a, a, you know, Committed, totally committed uh, to reaching net zero, um, but have been recognising that not every region of the UK uh, would have to have entire net zero for the UK to reach net zero. So, um, given a, 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 our our high high uh, proportion of um, people who are involved in agriculture, given the higher numbers of people who live in rural areas, we are in a slightly different position. And they have, they have acknowledged that, and I think that we all need to, to look at what is the maximum that we can reasonably achieve uh, and make our contribution to that. Um, but it is not a, not a matter of us running away from responsibilities in climate change. Um, we are going to take them and take them very, very seriously. Uh, but it is important that, that we do it in a way which doesn't you know, kill off jobs, um, kill off opportunity, and you know, drive people away from rural communities uh, in the process of doing it. A um, couple of things at the latter end you come in with, Philip, there, just to remind me of them. Uh, Single-use plastics and yeah. positive return schemes. Yeah, no, I'm glad yeah, you raised that one. Um, I signed off yesterday on uh, a policy. Uh, I think it will involve a bit of legislative change, uh, but that will raise um, the, 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 the cost of the plastic bag levy. Um, it will remove the cap on it, the, the current cap on it. I think it's 20 pence. Um, it'll, it'll, it'll remove that uh, and will we'll raise the levy on, on all plastic bags. Um, on the single-use policy, that is something that, that we're happy to, to, to look at in conjunction with yourselves and uh, you know see, see how, how we can achieve that. We have already taken steps, for example, to remove, I think it's nine different single-use plastics um, from government departments. Uh, and and uh, that that has been put out there. So, a lot of those um, single-use plastics we, we're already identifying and picking off. Uh, but it's certainly something that you know we 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 all have very similar aims and and, and goals upon. Okay. Sorry, just I mean, uh, have you has the department any intention of introducing a deposit return scheme this side of uh, the mandate? That is something that we're working on um, uh, and, you know, would be hopeful that we could. Um, but uh, we've had some resistance from, from some of the, the, the large bottlers on it um, and they're concerned with, with, with um, some of the proposals. Um, however, we have been working, for example, with people um, in Bryson, um, renewables had done a scheme in, in Whitehead, a trial scheme, uh, which struck me as being something which provided a great opportunity. Where, you know, whenever you bought your 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 deposit your, through the deposit renew, renewable scheme, um, you bought the product, you paid the additional money on it, um, you had an app on your phone, you scanned into your phone when you recycled that, um, or, or, or put that back into the system. Uh, and and you got your money back, which was would help ensure that those products don't end up in, in landfills or dumped at the side of the road because people um, would have paid the deposit on it, 
um, and, and the, they had the ability to easily get that deposit back. So the smart, there's clever ways of doing this. Um, it, it'll probably not be um, what I done as a child and, and thought it was great when I spotted a bottle in a head because there was 10p to buy, buy a few sweets and if we could get, get up a few more of them, that, that, that was all, all the better for that. And, you know, hook about my mum's kitchen to try and find bottles and go up to the local garage to, to get them changed. It, it'll be a, hopefully something a little more sophisticated than that. Okay. Right. Philip. Okay. Ed. Uh, Patsy, you're looking in for a very quick one, aren't you? Just, just very, very quick. Um, what I wanted to establish was, and I don't need to rehearse the Brexit argument. People, people got the protocol because they, they voted Brexit and they supported a, a Tory government which negotiated the position that we're in. But what I wanted to find out, and yes, I accept, and I'm hearing there's two points I want to make. What I'm hearing from from Edwin here now, the the, the departmental personnel are up and Larn and other ports, and they're recognising what the issues are, and they're, they're, we've heard quite a few of those issues. We, the protocol was set up, as was the joint joint committee. Now, the joint committee was set up for a specific reason, set up for four-year based to observe what the issues were, to, to see what the shake was, because let's not forget, we're getting rid of almost 50 years of practice, of regulation and of legislation. So what I would like to know is those issues that have been relayed and ventilated here by, by the minister and others, what formal submission has there been to the British government to raise these at the joint committee because it is an EU UK government committee, uh, and that's the place to raise them. So I'd like to know first of all if that had been done, and secondly on on another thing. And I heard you minister there very loudly whenever we were talking about selling flowers and plants and, and the likes of that. Um, would would the minister accept that whenever it comes to selling flowers and plants, clothes, shoes, selling even mobile phones, that the big winners out of this are the multinationals? Uh, while whilst the, the high street itself has got a bit of a blast and, and um, the, I hear entirely what he's saying and a lot of sympathy for it. So um, what what is the minister of the minister an opinion on that indeed has an opinion on how we can develop the high street in many of our rural towns and villages? Uh, two, 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 two issues. Um, you know, you say you say Brexit, we say protocol, you say potato, we say, to, uh, you know, potato and all of that there. You know, we can go round and round in circles as to whose fault it is, uh, and we'll probably still arrive at the same position. However, set, setting up, setting aside who, whose the fault is, we clearly have a fault line. And it is, in my opinion, for all of the parties and the executive to start to focus on what we can do um, to ensure that um, the European Union's single market is protected, which I believe is an entirely reasonable uh, thing for them to, to, to seek, but which does not impose unnecessary uh, um, impositions um, on NIPLC, um, because ultimately that will harm our business and it will harm our um, consumers. So uh, in my view, all of the parties should be working together um, and going to the European Union, not seeking rigorous implementation, but actually seeking um, practical solutions. Uh, and I would welcome um, parties actually coming to a, a point where instead of headbutting each other, we're working with each other for solutions. Uh, and that, that, that is something which um, would be in all of our interests. Um, should, 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 we, should we actually do that? The second point, Patsy, remind me, or the latter, latter issue you were raising. Sorry, the second thing was about the, the multinationals. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Issues which the, the, yeah. the shops and the high streets can't. And if we could just make one point, Edwin, I'm trying to get to this point because I'm, I'm seeking solutions, genuinely seeking solutions. But I want to know, is the joint committee, which comprises the, the British government and the EU, is that joint committee getting a formal response from here, either from your department yeah. or from other departments? Oh, advise them as to, yeah. to what the issues are uh, in terms of that there i have written extensively mainly to george eustace but also to to, to uh, other ministers um outlining the issues um so it's all there in writing i have had numerous telephone calls i have engaged in numerous exo meetings so the issues have been made very clear um certainly at the uk level i've also written written to vice president Seftovich. 
um, and, and made it clear directly, but they won't negotiate with us in Northern Ireland. They, they negotiate through, through the UK government. Um, so we can't directly make, make, get over there to make a case or, or, or join them on, on a forum like this to make a case. Um, although the first Deputy First Minister did attend a meeting a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that was the first opportunity. Uh, so, yes, so all of that material um, has been got in there. In terms of um, you know, reopening of Northern Ireland, I have to say the, the figures have come down well. The pressures on our hospital are, 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 are now um, you know, very well reduced. And um, we do need to reflect upon all of that and, and start to reopen things in a phased way. Uh, which doesn't actually undermine what has been achieved on that. Uh, we also need to take account of the fact that there's around 600,000 people vac- or 600,000 vaccines distributed now. And uh, there's a large volume of vaccination going to take place over the course of the next number of weeks because of um, a, a major delivery coming from AstraZeneca. And we're in a very fortunate position in that. And, you know, you know in the latter part of, of last year, the chief medical officer in response to me said that the vaccination program would be a game changer and i think the public are ready now to see uh, what that game change is going to be but you're absolutely right in that the supermarkets have been absolutely creaming it in um while star small shops have been sitting looking on um, i would hope that um your party and, and others will support us in the executive in ensuring that there is equity and equality and uh, those small businesses, um, set, you know, people with only one employee the, the, themselves or, or maybe a couple of part-time staff have the opportunity to actually earn a living once again um, as opposed to sit there watching supermarkets uh, and PLCs cream, creaming it in. Yeah, Dad, thank you very much for that, Edwin. Uh, and just, just two, one brief observation. Um, the rural the rural policy that you're out rolling there, I would appreciate if that could be done in conjunction with the, there's a subcommittee of the executive on development of the high streets because many of those rural towns are, are going to be very, very badly affected by this. And uh, secondly, then just how your department would work with the opportunities that Invest NI has seen that we're put, and you acknowledge this, that we're in a position here in Northern Ireland which could be used ver- in a very, very positive way uh, to to uh, use the positive aspects of the outcome of the withdrawal agreement for to benefit our economy. Yeah, yeah, and and d- doubtless we'll work with whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, fun, 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 fundamentally, uh, I believe we need um, to to tackle all of these issues and, and ensure that there is um, zero friction between between our, ourselves. Um, and um, Great Britain on um, those materials that are coming into Northern Ireland that will be staying in Northern Ireland. And if we can facilitate um, the European Union and the Republic of Ireland in particular uh, in terms of the materials that, that, that could end up in the single market um, in a way which couldn't be done at the border, that, that isn't an unreasonable thing to be, to, to be seeking, but it is unreasonable to be imposing, um, you know, what is currently being asked of the people of Northern Ireland, and and I would encourage all parties to actually recognise that, and to state it, and ultimately, wouldn't it be what a really powerful message to the European Union, um, and the UK government for us all to come together and say, listen, this here is unnecessary, it is impractical, um, and it is an imposition, uh, which is causing harm, um, to the people that we represent, and um, here is a better way of doing it. Thanks, thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thank, thank you, Minister. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity now again, just to thank you again, Minister Pooch, uh, great to see you back and feeling uh, healthy healthy again, and, and hopefully your recovery will be very successful in the longer term as well. Um, so listen, uh, thank you for your attendance, and we'll, thank you. we'll be in contact, okay? Um, we're going to move on now to the next item on the agenda. Item number six is oral evidence on the withdrawal of local authority staff from the ports. I'm just going to go temporarily hand over to Philip here because I have nipped out for a few moments, but I'll be back in again, okay? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, uh, 
as the chair said just before leaving, we're at item number six, uh, uh, which is oral evidence uh, from the trade unions on the withdrawal of the local authority staff from the ports. So can I refer members to memo from the clerk at page 18, which outlines the committee's terms of reference uh, and issues to explore. And there's also papers from the trade unions on page 20. Can I rem remind members that this is the first of our oral sessions oral evidence sessions in relation to the committee's scrutiny on the DERA uh, and local authority decision to withdraw staff from the ports uh, due to an alleged security threat. So can I welcome uh, on to Starleaf here Alan Law, the Assistant Secretary of NIPSA, Alan Perry, General Officer of the GMB Union, and Kieran Ellison, who's the General Officer of UNITE. So uh, you're all very, very welcome. Uh, and what we're going to do then is ask yourselves to give a brief uh, presentation and then we will open up to questions from the members. So uh, I'm not sure which of you is going to kick off, but you're free to do so. I'll go first, uh, Vice Chair, and thanks for the invitation, uh, Chair and members. Um, so I represent NIPSA and we're accompanied here today by um, an official from Unite and an official from GMB and we would be the lead officials that take responsibility for the staff employed by Mid and East Antrim Borough Council. So the incidents in question um, commenced uh, in and around the 1st of February um, and it started off with uh, an email communication from uh, my colleague Kieran to the head of human resources in the council raising concerns and the, the email, just so that we quote it correctly, has been brought to my attention by a senior officer in Unite that staff whose job it is to carry out the Brexit NI protocol appear to have been threatened by graffiti and potentially other methods for carrying out the rule. Um, and that, that would be a fairly standard type of inquiry if we had any concerns about members. And I think it's important that we all bear in mind that uh, as trade union officials, our priority is the health and safety and well-being of the people we represent. So we take no exception to an employer um, wishing to withdraw staff because they feel those staff are at risk. However, we are concerned about how we were dragged into this uh, particular issue and certainly the uh, embellishment of statements attributed to us. And that has caused us great concern. I think it causes us concern because uh, I suppose uh, it would be our view that by including us in those statements, it is to give credence to council decisions, which we were not part of. So we received a response email from the council saying they were aware of this issue and it was uh, it was going to be discussed with uh, full council later that evening and that there was a group party leaders meeting. We've subsequently met with the mayor and he advised us that there's a group party leaders meeting around 3 p.m. that day. We were also made aware that the council had reached out to the PSNA in and around the same time and had been assured that there was no threat to staff. And it is our understanding that staff were advised of that and told that they would be able to continue working. Uh, there was a decision then taken later on in the evening to withdraw staff. And there is a significant gap in our understanding around how some of those decisions were made. And of course, that is where we all want to have a full understanding of this. Now, unlike scenarios where I've been involved in the past, where staff have had to be withdrawn from work, we've been surprised about the fact that council weren't um, wanting to meet with us first thing the next morning to alert us to the fact that this decision had been taken, to discuss with us what they knew about this, what they were going to do in order to protect the interests of the staff, any of those things. So the next morning, I was surprised that we hadn't received any communication from the employer to say that they had taken the decision. In fact, we all as trade union officials found out about it on the evening news. And that's the only way that we found out. Um, and then the next morning, the MP for the area was uh, on the radio making some very serious claims that uh, have not been repeated since one of which included that the trade unions were calling for staff to be withdrawn. And, and in addition to that, there was comments made about how uh, staff were, were so concerned because graffiti had appeared on gable walls near their homes. Now, we've never heard that repeated by anyone. We don't know where that information came from, and we don't know why it was stated, but it was stated. So um, anyway, the, the next day, 
I asked for a meeting, a Zoom meeting with the, the director responsible, and we actually never received a response to that request. So I made a telephone call to her, and um, I was concerned about the fact that council was saying in some of its statements that they had been in communications with the trade unions, when in fact the only communication to date had been a short email exchange between my colleague Kieran and the head of HR, and that was it. So, to, so we 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 were concerned that council were saying that they had been in communication with the trade unions when we know that that was not the case. However, um, because the mayor's statement was made um, as an oral statement, we um, were not officially uh, in receipt of it. So I managed to obtain a transcript and the mayor's statement, which was read out at the council meeting on the 1st of February, the particular paragraph that caused us great concern was the fact that it said, trade unions on behalf of council members of staff assisting with the checks at the port have raised serious concerns around increasing suspicious activity. Now, if it had stopped there, I think there was nothing in dispute. But it went on to say, such as in part apparent information gathering, including the taking of personal registration plates from their vehicles, we have no knowledge where that statement came from and why it was made. We've asked, we've repeatedly asked, we've asked for it to be withdrawn, we've spoken to them. It, it, it's simply uh, just beggars belief. Because I, I suppose from our point of view, if we had ever been aware that our members or members of staff of any union or known or not people who aren't even in a union were in the were in a position where they were having their number plates recorded and serious things like that were happening. Firstly, we would have alerted the PSNI, and secondly, we would have immediately discussed that with the employer about their immediate withdrawal. Uh, so it, it concerns us that someone would say that we were aware of things like that, and that the there was really no action taken on our part. And we've asked Council to clarify that, and we've failed to obtain any clarification. Then, um, in terms of how the Council has responded to this incident, we never had, despite our request, any formal meeting with the employer during this whole time. And that strikes all of us as utterly bizarre, because when you consider uh, you know, the, the what council have said in their public statements, um, we, we would have expected there, there, there would have been a need to meet with the trade unions to discuss this issue, to ensure that uh, the staff's well-being was protected. Because in all of this, there are people who have jobs to do, they have families, they have their own concerns about all of this, and, and, and clearly, any, anyone affected by a decision from an employer to withdraw the, them from work, they're going to be under stress around that. So we all would expect that any decisions taken in regards to that would be done based on um, you know, evidence that you would then meet with the stakeholders involved, which would be the, the trade unions. We would all discuss what we were going to do. That didn't happen. So on the 4th of February, we had a planned uh, local negotiating forum, which is um, the formal structure for the trade unions to meet with the employer. And there's an agenda and there's all sorts of issues on the agenda and we discuss those things. The council hadn't even decided at that meeting that we were worthy of an update as to why any of this had happened. Uh, and it was us that brought it up. Uh, and we particularly brought up the issue of the incorrect and inaccurate mayor's statement because um, you know, I think it, it's important when issues like this happen that um, you know the facts are clear, that we all understand why things are being said, that they're accurate, and that people have confidence that the decisions and everything that's happening is based on the best information available, and that there's no misrepresentation of any of the information that exists. So that that has been um, really, in a nutshell, the issues that we have had concern with the employer. Now, you know, we, we, we copied you into uh, and we provided you with some um, information that we have issued. And we then felt, because we were getting nowhere with the uh, employer, 
that we would need to ask the Chief Executive a number of questions, and I've provided that email that we issued to the um, Chief Executive on the 2nd of February. We then also issued a statement calling for the Council to withdraw the inaccurate remarks that were attributed to us and to clarify their official record, because we, we believe that you know we have a good faith relationship. We work productively and positively with this employer and that we need that to be based on accurate and truthful statements. Um, and and that, um, that has been a particular area of concern. Um, we've then met with the, the, chief execu uh, the chief executive and mayor and raised our concerns. And there was an acceptance uh, in that meeting that the council statement was inaccurate and, been, and had been a miscommunication. Uh, but I think really to dismiss these matters as a miscommunication uh, is just somewhat unhelpful because, you know, when you get to a stage where you're withdrawing staff because of uh, threats to their safety, then any information that a public authority issues has to be accurate. And we all have to understand what's being said and why it's being said. And we feel through this whole process, there was very limited engagement with us to really ensure that every step was that was taken was done so on a good faith basis. And that's really um, all I need to add at this stage. Okay, Alan, thank you very much for, for that. That, that. That mean we did receive uh, the, your documentation, uh, that plus your update has been very fulsome, so appreciate that. Can, can I just kick off before uh, going around the room in terms of members uh, asking questions. So there, there's a couple of issues here. There's obviously the issue of uh, the misleading statement and information provided at the council meeting, uh, and you used the words uh, embellishment uh, of the, the concerns that the trade union have. And then the, the other issue, I suppose, is the actual decision itself and the process and engagement that led to that. Can, can I just ask, Alan, for clarification, in terms of you, the trade union request for the withdrawal of the, the misleading uh, allegations or embellishment of, of information from the trade union and the correcting of the record, has that happened to date? Not to my knowledge. Now, I, th I think there's been some suggestion that there's been clarification issued to us, uh, but I'm not aware of any formal statement in the council chamber withdrawing those remarks. Okay. And, and just in terms of, because you read them out, I mean, the, the mayor on that particular night said trade unions on behalf of council uh, members of staff uh, assisting uh, checks in the Port of Larne have, had very, have raised very, very serious concerns uh, around increasing suspicious activity, such as apparent information gathering, including the taking of personal registrations from their vehicles. So you, you have said then, before then, uh, and now you or the trade unions have no uh, no information about that. You have no idea where that came from. You have no knowledge whatsoever about that line in the mayor's statement. No. And we've, we, we've asked them why they would say that in relation to the very limited information that was contained in the email from my colleague, Kieran. Um, I mean, you've got, you've got to appreciate that um, if, this, if this had, uh, if COVID didn't exist, we, you know, we'd all been straight down to the, the poor area, wanting to meet with people face to face and, and see what's going on. But but those there are, there are certain restrictions in relation to non essential travel, so that has been prevented. But we certainly know that we did not say and have never said, and there's no uh, communication from us whatsoever to indicate that staff are having their number plates recorded. And and I, I can only imagine if I was a member of staff hearing that for the first time potentially on the evening news, I would have been horrified. And we were certainly horrified. Uh, so, and you have asked both the mayor and the chief executive of Midland East Antrim Council about that line, how it came to be inserted in the mayor's statement that night. You've asked for it to be uh, withdrawn and clarified, and you, you have a, no explanation to this point about how it arrived there yet. None. Uh, I mean, it is being put down to a miscommunication. 
it's a very serious miscommunication. I mean, you know, I've seen we've all seen the email uh, from Kieran to uh, a senior member of staff, uh, and as you rightly outlined, it does say concerns. But you know, there, there's a brave jump uh, in terms of miscommunication from the, using the word concern to uh, information gathering, such as the taking of number plates and registration of vehicles. Uh, absolutely, and certainly the response that we received from the uh, council head of HR about sixteen thirty-seven, the same day, did not indicate to us that this had even reached the stage where people were being it was being considered that staff would be withdrawn from work. I mean, it refers to how there was meetings going on and that sort of thing, but we certainly weren't aware that it had reached the threshold that council who now advise us that they were in receipt of all sorts of communications and sensitive emails, none of which anyone has seen, uh, to suggest that there were there were things happening in the background that they needed to take action on. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, we wholeheartedly support any employer that feels that there is safety of their staff at risk and need to withdraw people to protect their health, safety and well-being. And that has never been in dispute. And I, I think I, I need to repeat that because I don't want there to be any ambiguity. You know, if there is any safety concerns for staff and an employer cannot uh, reasonably uh, support the staff in the workplace because of those concerns, then it's absolutely important that those staff's well-being is paramount. But that's not what's at stake here. It's the fact that the employer said that there were staff having their number plates recorded and that information came from the trade unions when it simply didn't happen. Okay. Uh, and do you have, I mean, I know you're saying it didn't come from the trade unions. Have you, uh, I mean, I'm, I don't want to hog this. I have a couple of questions and I'm going to open up to the, the, the rest of the members. Just do you have any information that that was happening? Never mind that it was, wasn't no, it? No. Right. So, yeah, no, I, I know no more about that, that, the inclusion of those remarks in this statement now than I did when the mayor read it out on the 1st of February. Okay, and then very quickly, I mean, the, have you, the trade unions, seen the PSNI's risk assessment? And secondly, you, you said something that, that, that I ha probably hadn't heard in that the, I mean, the council were informed by the PSNI before the decision was made that there was no threat and that the PSNI, I think you said that the PSNI relayed that to council staff. So before this decision was made that night, yeah. either through the PSNI or the council staff were told that there was no threat to them. I think, I think maybe just to be absolutely clear, it is our understanding, uh, yeah. and that's through sources that we have, that the council con was in contact throughout the day uh, with the PSNA, and it then advised the staff in around 3 p.m. that they had it confirmed that there was no threat to staff and that they could continue to work. However, subsequently between that and the uh, council meeting, a decision was taken that a threshold had reached uh, and staff were withdrawn from work. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to ask some members to come in now. Harry? Thank you very much. Vice Chair, and thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, did the trade unions have serious concerns in relation to the safety of employees of the council? Potentially were serious threats, according to the Unite Reps email of the 1st of February. What changed for the unions if they took exception to the temporary decision by the council to protect the welfare of their staff until the degree and severity of a situation was appropriately ascertained? Um, priority being staff safety? Well, I suppose, as I've said in yeah. my remarks, that we have never taken exception to the withdrawal of staff. We think an employer taking that decision to make sure that their staff's health, safety and well-being were, were upheld is absolutely mm -hmm. paramount. And we would never have, and we do not uh, diverge from that. Uh, but what we do diverge from is the fact that in the statement that's that's been attributed to us, that it's being alleged quite clearly that we told the council that staff are having their number plates recorded, and that simply did not happen. As for the staff being withdrawn from work, if an employer feels that their safety can no longer be protected or maintained, then it's absolutely important that the employer takes steps to protect those staff, and if that needs to include the withdrawal of staff from work until they can assure themselves that it's safe to go back, then absolutely, uh, we, we would never 
diverge from that, and nor have we, actually. Okay. Would the unions have preferred that the council had taken no action and potentially left their members at risk of harm? Well, I've quite clearly stated that we would never have preferred that to be the case. Yeah. Uh, what we don't understand is what events were occurring on the 1st of February, mm -hmm. or what events occurred when staff returned to work later that week, because to our knowledge, nothing really changed in terms of uh, the the environment uh, in the in the local community. But something occurred on the first, which regard at which the council decided passed a threshold to require the withdrawal of staff, and then later in the week something occurred which uh, allowed the council to return the staff to work. I think we've always said, and we continue to say, that the health safety and well-being of the staff is paramount and when an employer believes that they need to withdraw those staff to protect them then they have our full and absolute support in that. Yeah. Um, Alan, maybe you could tell me when was the PSNI risk threat assessment requested and when was it carried out? Is this acceptable time frame given the severity of the situation? Um, I hope you, I hope you uh, and, and will be uh, content with my explanation but I wouldn't have the knowledge of when the PSNI risk assessment was requested or indeed how long it would take or yeah. when it was carried out. We're aware that the council had a risk assessment provided to them. Well, I think they call it a risk assessment is really what an employer does. I think mm -hmm. what the PSNI does is called a threat assessment. Uh, so, so, so I know the terms sound you know, fairly similar, but there is an important distinction. So the PSNI threat assessment uh, my understanding, and you'll need to get council officers to clarify that, that that was requested either the Monday or the Tuesday and was provided to council later in the week. And uh, we certainly had sight of the council's risk assessment, which took took into account the PSNI threat assessment, and that was provided to us sort of towards the end of the week um, as well. Okay, I understand. Appreciate that, all, and thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair. I see the chair's back in. I'm going to hand over to him. No problem. Okay, I'm going to move on around Patsy. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Chair. And thank you, Alan, and your colleague, Kieran there for coming along and being so so frank with us. Um, could, could I just ask, um, in relation to the, the sequence there on the 1st of February and the email from your colleague, Kieran, and he's probably best placed to, to speak about this. Now, um, there's two or three things about that that I want to ask, two specifically, I should say. Um, the first one is, there's mention there of a senior Unite colleague having relayed the information along. Now, following on from that, um, did now, I know any of the rest of us, if we received an email like that from someone we knew and trusted as uh, probably a colleague or at least someone who works in the trade union side, the very first thing we would want to do is find out more about it. So are you aware if, in fact, well, Kieran will be fit to tell me if, in fact, anyone from the council contacted him or his senior colleague at the council to establish more detail around what these allegations or perceived allegations were about? Um, it has been verified to us now that, um, I presume it has been verified, no one was threatened or intimidated and there were no reports of this to, to police or council or anything like that, and no vehicle registration numbers were taken. So can you advise, firstly, if anyone in senior management role either spoke to Kieran, I'm presuming not, or his colleague, senior colleague in Unite, or on foot of the email, are you aware that, or if the PSNI followed up to establish further details on that, I presume not to Kieran, but to his other colleague that's referred to in the email, please. Um, could, I, could I let my colleague Kieran respond to the, the, the majority of your points? I have, for the, help of, for the help of the committee, provided you with the communications that took place, and the communications were by email, and I provided you with the emails that we received. So there was three emails, one at 13.45, one at 16.37, which was a response from the employer, and a follow-up from Kieran at 16.41. Um, but Kieran could, be, could best answer, and I provided those to the committee. But Kieran I've could best answer thank any you. other aspects of that. What I'm trying to establish if anybody actually lifted a telephone uh, to try and drill down on the detail of this, it's not 
But wouldn't they agree to be doing this sort of business by, by email? That's, for, that's what I'm saying. Uh, for, the, for the purposes of your uh, inquiries, um, I emailed council the next morning at nine, uh, 17 minutes past nine. Uh, didn't get a reply, so I eventually phoned the director who has responsibility for these staff around 10.30. And to, that is, to my knowledge, the only proactive communication that we were involved in. That was that was on you. That was you did that. It wasn't the employer, right? No, that's right. But uh, again, if you maybe want to ask, I mean, Kieran can come in here and, and release the emails, please. Thank you, and thank you for giving me time. Uh, the email that I put together was the officer who I'm subordinate to got in touch with me and told me because we're all working from home um, that he was had become aware. Hi, I'm not sure, but he had become aware that there was graffiti going up in areas um, which appeared to target those carrying out the Brexit NI protocol. Um, and from there, he also says that he had a belief that there may be stuff also on social media around that. But the graffiti thing was easier to understand. Um, the, the stuff that may be on social media would have required quite a degree of going searching and going looking for that. So instead of me specifically calling that out, I refer to that as potentially all our methods. So from there, that email went in so that the employer, because Richard is incredibly busy as our trade union officials doing, and not looking sympathy, but doing 70, 80 hour weeks for quite a considerable period of time. And the ability while people's on Zoom calls, et cetera, to make contact has proven through experience to be very difficult. So um, I put in an email um, so that that was in the system expecting that Richard may get back to us or preferably by phone, but he chose to do it by email. Um, so really what I was looking was that this was on the radar and that they were aware that these behaviors that are being reported to me are that they're cognizant of it and thus essentially asking them uh, that I'm seeking assurances that mid east Stanton is risk assessing and introducing security measures for these staff if the risk assessment obviously deems that necessary. There was no phone calls from me to mid east Stanton, nor was there any phone calls uh, responded to me uh, uh, back from any employees at mid east Stantrum from the bottom to the top of the organisation. In fact, as Alan has alluded to and pointed out, the communication with trade unions was sadly lacking. Um, that would be my viewpoint on it. So, was. so I, I'm open to be open and honest and answer questions. I Hopefully that met the answers that you were looking. Well, uh, just a bit more, because part of the question that I was asking was the, the colleague that you referred to in the email who had spoken to you, about graffiti appearing as as he or she had seen it and other stuff on social media. Um, was the council aware of the identity of that individual? And if so, did they go to speak to that individual to seek further detail around what these uh, allegations or perceptions or, or a, um, information that this person had to, to establish just what, to get to the core of what the issue was? In short, the answer to that's no. They didn't. I, um, it, I, the only correspondence they had was a senior officer uh, in Unite, so they didn't have the person who that was in order that they could go and ask that person, but equally they did not come back to me in an exploratory manner to find out who that individual was that they could then go and um, have that conversation with them. But um, to, to try and be balanced in it, I don't think it... I think by that stage, in many communities that were be perceived as potentially Protestant unionist or loyalist, that this graffiti had been on the wall um, within a recent time frame. I know in the area that I live, um, that there were several instances of that in the locality, so there was. So um, I don't think that they would need to verify too far with the senior member of the United Union that there was graffiti on the wall, because my understanding is on the way in the Larn um, that that already had been 
trying to find the right word, tagged on the walls or sprayed on the walls or whatever method, you know, painted on the walls in that method so I had. So I don't think that you would need to go and verify too far that there was graffiti in areas around it in areas that may be perceived to be Protestant Unionists or Loyalists. No, I don't think that's the issue. Uh, it's not the graffiti. It's whenever somebody refers to potentially other methods, um, that's that's a pretty broad gambit of what potentially that could be. And so what you're telling me is whenever a reference was made to council of people being threatened via graffiti and potentially other methods, that the council didn't contact you to establish, A, what potentially those other methods would be, or B, to make contact with the person, uh, the senior officer in Unite, who could be able to elaborate as to what potentially those other methods might be. So, the, and there was none of that done. And just just for to sort of tidy it up a wee bit, the police didn't do likewise. The police didn't come to you to speak to you about this. And the police didn't speak, and so far as you can speak for the other senior officer, the police didn't speak to him to establish essentially what potentially those other methods were likewise. That's, that entirely, that's entirely correct. And the first time that that detail was drilled down on was whenever that senior officer appeared on the Stephen Nolan show. They asked questions um, around the email exchange. That's okay, right? That's grand. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Alan and Kieran. Thank you. No issue. Thank you, uh, Patrick and Kieran. Uh, John? Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I thank Alan and Kieran for, for being with us and, and uh, obviously uh, assure them that, that um, all of us take seriously these matters and, and staff um, who have probably been placed under additional pressure by actions that took place um, also have our support. I want to, Chair, if you may, uh, hone in on, on a couple of details here. Um, if I could refer, first of all, to the email, it's on page 22 of my report. It's an email on the 1st of February at 1637 from the head of HR to, to Kieran. Um, I, I don't know in advance how important or relevant this detail is going to be to, to the trade union side, but I think it's important for clarification for this committee and for this inquiry that we probably do our best to, to clarify this. The email states that the group party leaders ha are meeting, and we know that, that's been discussed. It also indicates that council are also meeting with Minister Poots, and this is the relevance to this committee. Um, I'm keen to ask not to put anybody under pressure if, if the trade union side agree that that indicates either full council or a representative group of the council were meeting with the government minister. Um, I believe that not to be the case that one or two individuals, if any, met with the minister. But um, are, are the trade union side, first of all, aware that um, that would not have been full council or necessarily a representative group of the council? Well, uh, in the email, it just refers to council or meeting with yeah. Minister Pitts. Um, and that, that, in my view, could, incl could, could include full council. It could also include officers of council uh, delegated to meet uh, with Minister Putz. So I, I don't, I don't know, and I, I don't think it would be fair for me to to comment exactly on who that would have been intended to refer to. But it certainly indicated that council were meeting with the minister to discuss these issues. Yeah, uh, so that's, whether that's limited to a group of councillors, group party leaders, the entire council. Or a council officer on okay. their behalf. Yeah, or or as the case may be, uh, none of the above. And and I, I'm clarifying, uh, Alan. I have to make clear not to get an opinion, but so that this um, inquiry and this stage of the inquiry is clear is clear that 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 line may not give a full picture. Um, if I could refer to the chief the chief executive's email, which is on at least in my report, I think page twenty six and page thirty three. I have to say that email doesn't tell me very much. Um, it couldn't possibly tell you anything about the assurances that you've been looking. But can I ask then for, for uh, again, for clarification, um, have you been given any indication or even a holding reply on what is, on what is holding up 
the withdrawal of the remarks an explanation why they haven't been withdrawn or whether or not they're likely to be withdrawn? I, I have um, no further knowledge in respect of that. Uh, I, I simply don't understand the resistance to, uh, you know, formally withdraw these remarks and, and set the record straight. I think that would have been helpful and I think it would have um, alleviated from the employer's perspective the uh, intense scrutiny that they were subject to from both local, uh, regional and national media. And so I, I don't understand the resistance in, in ensuring that the record of their statement was amended, it was clarified formally, and that we received the, the responses we required. Okay, you, you, you've been given no information as to uh, if or when that withdrawal might happen? I've been given no indication. Now, I, th I think there was some suggestion the mayor may have issued something on social media in respect of this. I haven't been able to track that down, so you know, perhaps others may be able to achieve that. But that certainly wouldn't be the way that we would expect this to be communicated. So uh, I think that the most constructive way uh, would be to withdraw the remarks at the next opportunity at council meeting. I know when the mayor was pressed on the media about this issue, he, he dismissed it as a distraction. Now, it, it took up a, an entire paragraph of his statement, and therefore to dismiss that as a distraction, I felt was unhelpful and uh, not in keeping with really the, the, the tone of the discussion around this issue. Okay. Okay, but it wasn't, wasn't um, relayed directly to you or to the uh, union? I've had no communication from council, uh, including my colleagues, uh, formally withdrawing these remarks and setting the record straight. Uh, you know, th that's just the bottom line in relation to that. Okay, so thank you for that. Thank Can you. I interject? Yeah. Uh, 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 the, the most that we have got is... A discussion between the three officials, the head of HR, the chief executive and the mayor, at which they acknowledged that the remarks attributed to the trade unions were incorrect. And the best, and it's up for you to judge of your own volition, um, your own thoughts on it, but really the best of a, a reason put forward, I don't want to use the term excuse was, but that it was a very busy day with a lot going on and this needed to be judged and dealt with in a manner you know very quickly expedient to the issue at hand so it was but i i, I have at myself expressed skepticism that um for such a huge deviation from what i actually put in my email to what was attributed to my remark you know that um a lack of time would have led to that so at best we have had acknowledgement that what is what is actually attributed to us was incorrect and that it was due to a short turnaround time but certainly i'm not aware of any official correspondence with us or anything circulated widely that that removes that remark in any means okay thank you thank you for that Kieran. okay um uh, william hey, can you hear me now yeah yeah. Um, thank you, Kieran. Uh, to me, for me, the rights and wrongs of what unions were told and weren't told are probably important to yourselves. But I think my view would have been in this: the protection of staff was paramount, and normally the precautionary route was the best route to take. Um, we we're told we, like, I mean, I, I like the rest. I'm sure was. Uh, only aware of news reports, and one report said that the uh, it, sh it showed the mayor of the council uh, in a meeting uh, making the announcement and said it, it was a unanimous decision of the council to take that decision. Uh, am I not right in saying that it was a precautionary uh, issue to ensure that the staff, the safety of staff, was paramount, and uh, at the end of the day. Would that not have been a wise decision under the circumstances? Um, 
Mr. Irwin, I think I've said already that we do not uh, diverge from the Council's decision making in relation to this. Uh, I have raised my concerns around the fact that this was seen to be a, a unanimous decision at Council because actually, uh, no disrespect to the councillors, but it actually wasn't their decision to take. It, it's the Chief Executive's decision to take as the officer responsible for the staff and therefore I, I, I would have hated to have seen a scenario where she wanted to withdraw the staff, but there wasn't a decision to, to withdraw the staff because councillors voted in some way to, to not do that. I don't think that would have been constructive or helpful for anyone. Um, and certainly, I don't think it would have been helpful if, for example, the councillors took various decisions and and, no, and it wasn't unanimous. Uh, I, I, we made it clear to the council, and we continue to make it clear to yourselves today, that we don't diverge from the decision to withdraw staff if you feel their sta your staff are at risk. And, and that's not a, a, an issue at all. And we've never, ever in this entire scenario said that we would have any concerns around that. Our concerns principally remain that we were being accused of having told council that staff are having their number plates recorded. And that, that's quite a serious development for people because that implies that people's personal safety is not only at risk because they're at work, but that people are trying to form some sort of database or information around where they may live, follow them home, target their families, target their homes. So there, you know, there is some quite serious connotations around implying that. And I would have thought that the first anyone hearing that on the media, well, that's no way to handle an issue for your staff. I mean, if your staff are, are going to be taken out of work and you then think, well, it's because there's graffiti in Larn, and then the mayor reads a statement to say that the trade unions have also alerted your employer that your number plates are being recorded. I mean, that is not the actions of someone who's wanting to behave responsibly. Okay. Okay. Could I, could I interject there? In the email that I originally sent, it quite clearly states, I am seeking assurances that Midmeath Dondrum is risk assessing the issue and introducing security measures for the staff. So we all wanted the staff to be protected. That was the, the primary purpose of the email. At, I, at no stage did I diverge into politics. The only thing that I was interested in was the safety of the staff. Could, could, that, could, that, could that email not have been taken as your support in that situation? For the removal of that? But it is. We we do. So we we have always uh, my myself, my colleague here, and and GMB Alan Perry. We all support the council's decision to withdraw staff because they feel they felt a threshold had been reached that st staff needed to be taken out of work because of safety concerns. That's we have never diverged from that. But we don't believe that it's helpful to add additional comments attributed to the trade unions that never existed. Because it creates fear and it creates anxiety, which didn't need to happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, uh, Morris. Morris. Yes, Chair. Yeah, yep, I'm here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Alan and Kieran, for your presentation. Uh, that's cleared an awful lot of things up. But there really, the the the. Uh, importance that staff safety must be paramount. I agree with you, and, and I think all steps are taken along those lines. But having been a councillor for some 18 and a half years, I, I know that sometimes the, the, the union member, individual, being a fellow trade unionist, and would say things to me that they wouldn't say to, to their officials or to their line managers and so on and so forth. So there can be jungle drums. But what I was wanting to ask, and it's only a tiny, tiny matter, uh, really, Alan or Cairn, has any of your members contacted you directly over this year prior to the withdrawal? Had any of, any of your members actually made contact with any of the union officials to say, look, there's something happening here? Uh, or, or did they not contact you at all? Or did they not contact you until after the press statement? Um, there, there, was no, there has been no contact in relation to that issue. And that, that uh, in itself uh, would maybe explain that the staff probably haven't the concerns that, that uh, have been attributed here. But in terms of the, 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 whole, the whole piece that we're trying to get to the bottom of, if anyone had at any stage 
contacted me, Kieran or Alan Perry, and said, I'm concerned my number plate's been recorded. I'm concerned I'm being followed. I'm concerned anything sinister is happening in relation to me. This this wouldn't be something that we wouldn't be straight onto the employer saying there are major concerns here in relation to certain things, and we would have explained those to the employer. And, and that's how unions work. We protect our members' interests. So there, we would never have, have, have held back on that on that issue. Yeah, Alan, uh, listen, I've, a tra I'm a tra I've been a trade unionist for quite a long time, and I know how they work. But I know that sometimes uh, the direct contact of somebody you know is made quicker than to somebody who's in an official domain like yourself. So I'm, I'm just aware that sometimes uh, union members contact, it could be their councillors, uh, it could be a friend who is in the council, it could be a council officer. They would do that before they would contact yourselves. And I think think that's maybe what, what we're nailing it down to. But thanks for the answers anyway. Thanks, Kieran. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, Philip, you will come in there for a quick one. Thank you, sir. J just briefly, because I mean, I, I want to assure the, the members of the trade union, uh, you know, that despite so, so maybe some individual committee members downplaying this as some kind of miscommunication or, or, or non-event, this committee taken, has taken this issue very, very seriously, H hence our inquiry. Uh, you know, we, uh, we take the issue of the decision uh, around safety of staff very, very seriously, whether it's mid and east Antrim council staff or other council staff or dear official staff. And this decision was a major decision. And this is inquiry is trying to ascertain, you know, how that decision was made, on what information it was based on. And so well, from the trade union's point of view, I mean, I totally understand uh, the upset that you feel that that you know, information was attributed to you that didn't come from you, uh, and the impact that that have on users' uh, a movement and on your individual staff. You know, th this this committee does uh, is going to try and through this inquiry to get to the bottom of where this information came from, why it it was used, you know, why other processes weren't followed, why the information from the police uh, maybe was overlooked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, just. Uh, be assured that the committee takes what you have presented to us very seriously and this inquiry will, will diligently try to get to the bottom of how the, and why this decision was made. Uh, well, thank you for that assurance. And I know my colleague Kieran's wanting to come in, but I, I mean, from, from our perspective, we are no further uh, aware today than we were at the time the statement was issued. If anyone was having their number plates recorded, and I have had no information presented to me by anyone to suggest that that statement would have been accurate if it hadn't been attributed to the trade unions. If the council had just said, well, we are aware that this is happening. We're, we are still not aware that anyone had their number plates recorded and no one, including the council, has provided us with any statement or assurances to say, well, actually, we were aware this was happening. We shouldn't have said you said it. That type of thing. We, we, our, our position is that uh, that thing was attributed to us, but as well as that, we, we're not aware that actually it was occurring. And no one has provided us any evidence to suggest that it was. Okay. Um, thank you. And Claire, Claire, do you want a very quick point to the very end here? Yeah, um, a very similar email was sent to Belfast City Council also, um, if we're looking at a reasonable comparator, um, and how they dealt with the situation was entirely different. There was no misattribute of remarks, um, and there was constructive updates regularly sent back to the trade unions. They also withdrew their staff, of which there was absolutely no complaints or um, derision of that decision um, taken from trade union side. So. It's just to make you aware that, you know, how yeah. this was handled and different local authorities was handled very differently. Okay, thank you. Claire, are you looking at a quick point to the, as a last point here? Thanks, Declan. Just a wee quick one. Many of my issues were addressed already, but again, just want to put on record that um, our thoughts are with the, the staff and any continued threat with them, really. And um, I just wanted to ask if any of your members or staff in general at, at the ports have been in touch with you. Um, do they continue to fear for their personal safety today at all that you're aware of? Um, I, I think in order to you know protect the interests of staff, I don't think we, 
I'm going to comment on that question. Anything in relation to staff health, safety and well-being, we address with the employer and we continue to do so. Uh, and I think that would be the only constructive response that I could give. Okay, thanks for that, Alan. And is there any constructive um, dialogue going on on that issue then with their employer? Um, th there's been no proactive engagement with the employer. I mean, I mean, there there was talk of establishing a WhatsApp group. Should there be the need to sort of urgently update trade unions in relation to that? But beyond that, no. Uh, yeah. the, the, the director who looks after them did share with us the risk assessment for not the not the PSNI threat assessment but the council's risk assessment with us um, on two occasions to the best of my knowledge um, and welcomed remarks back from us. But given the circumstances of marks being misattributed to us, then you have to understand that from there, there's a breakdown in trust and communication um, and the detrimental that effect that that had on open dialogue where you don't know if you go back with anything further, whether next minute that's going to make the Nolan show and turn into, excuse my language, a pantomime type subject on such a serious issue. Right. Okay, then, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, I'll, um, I'd like to take this opportunity then, Alan, the two Alans and Kieran. Thank you very much for coming here this morning. Uh, for attending uh, very comprehensive answers and we really appreciate you taking the time out to meet us here this morning so thank you very much okay and uh, have a thank nice day too. okay can I get an agreement from members to publish the briefing papers from TUS onto the committee's web page members okay 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 members we're going to move on now swiftly we're uh, uh, to um, item seven on the agenda it's an oral evidence session from the Agricultural Consultants Association, NIAPA, um, on the independent panel on review of decisions. Um, I want to refer to the memo at page 35 and a briefing paper from ACA at 39 and NIAPA at 48. An update from the research, uh, research paper um, on the comparison of CAP review of decisions, appeals, procedures in, um, in, in the UK and the South. And... Um, and that's at page 50. So I'd like to welcome by Starleaf, David Rankin, Rankin, the chairperson of ACA, and Jim Carmichael, the development officer of NIAPA. And I'd like to invite the representatives to take 10 minutes to brief the committee, and then the members will, will want to ask uh, some questions. And I want to apologise as well to um, David and Jim, that we're running a wee bit late with a we're a very packed agenda here this morning. So I want to apologise in advance uh, and thank you sincerely for taking the time to join us here this morning. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, Jim. I, I don't know whether does David want to lead off or does he want? Can Can you hear me all right there? Yeah. Yeah, Jim. I think I. I. If you don't mind. Um, senior do you go first? <laughs> oh, well, uh, you, you'll go first anyway, David. You know, senior Artie or not, <laughs> it's your insistence. You'll go ahead. Tear away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear, hear it all right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and good afternoon to you, to you all. Um, as a way of introduction, uh, myself, I'm a retired Dar Dera Beef and Sheep Advisor, having worked all my department career in County Down until I retired in 2008. Uh, those were the good old days. Dard and Dara had time for farmers, ensuring that they received the best advice on a one-to-one -one basis, and even then they benefited from all the, the farm grants and schemes that were available. After I retiring, I started my own agriculture consultancy business. And then I realized what hard work really was. Our consultancy business has a, a large clientele of farmers throughout Northern Ireland. Our main role is completing staffs, transfers, environmental woodland, 
No, no, it's a status with the assembly. I'm on a topic on the review of decisions and appeals. I have one part-time member of staff, but because of all the work we are involved in, is practically with me full-time. We also cover a wide range of NAP paperwork and calculations, and we have the largest number of derogated farmers that any agent has. And I was very glad that uh, Minister Lyons, when he was in post, extended the deadline to have all these uh, submitted. It's also, it was good to see uh, Minister Pritch back in office and we wish him we and well on his uh, journey of recovery. Mr Chairman, today I'm representing the Agriculture Consultants Association Northern Ireland, where I've been chairman for the last 12 years. Our association was formed in 2006 for like-minded professionals who assist farmers with the administration of the wide range of data schemes relating to their farm business. We regularly meet with DERA to discuss a range of topics that we are involved with. I should say, Mr. Chairman, we have a very good working relationship with all the DERA staff, from those in the local DERA direct offices right up to Dr. Jason Foy and his colleagues who attended an earlier meeting with you on the 28th of January on this topic. I would like to give our views on the review of decisions and the independent panel, which has been receiving a lot of coverage recently in the Irish Farmers Journal and on radio, after judicial review favoured the Barnwell Farm appeal. I was pleased to hear Dr. Jason Foy say on the 28th of January at your committee that the department was going to look at the role of independent panels. And we in the Agriculture Consultants Association feel this would be an opportune time to look at, at how the whole ROD process is conducted. In 2017, there was a consultation, and you should have already received our submission to that consultation. Also, you should have read our, our, our written submission, but I would now like to go into a, a bit more detail. A point Jason Foy st stated on the 28th of January is that DERA must ensure that claimants of the various schemes adhere to the rules and legislation. When farmers are appealing a DERA decision, they will receive a large file of all the EU regulations, which nobody outside the department has seen, and definitely not the vast majority of farmers. I am presently involved in a stage two appeal and we'll be meeting the independent panel later this month. In this case, the case report extends to 170 pages in length, and that is only for a small farmer trying to prove he is an active farmer. What would it be like for those of the bigger appeals, e.g. the Barnwell, Barnwell Farm Appeal? This bundle of a file is definitely off-putting, and to me suggests it is all one-sided, as the interpretation of the law and regulation resides with DERA. We have an ageing pop farmer population who don't know or understand all this legal jargon. It is complicated and feels to be easier explained. And when we feel it would be easier explained at an appeal, if only the paperwork associated with that case was, re was being reviewed. DERA interprets the EU and national rules and regulations. Apply them, and if the farmer is not adhering or obeying these rules, DERA will make a decision, and then the business is breached and financially penalised. Initially, the farm business, when they receive it, the details of breach or rejection for a scheme, are devastated, and they then either go to their agriculture consultant, agent, the UFU or NIAPA for help and advice. I know that our members go through the investigation at that stage and in several cases say to the client it's a waste of time. But the largest percentage of cases we recommend to continue to stage one. We would then submit a stage one appeal which data checks and makes a decision. If it is rejected, the farmer can then go to stage two and present a case with perhaps additional evidence and information. I know, I, I'm assuming that you all are well aware of this procedure. 
There are rules that no additional information can be provided to the panel. The panel sits and looks at the case with all the information that DARA has provided and gives the farmer or their agent the opportunity to put their arguments forward. However, as one panel member told me at a recent interview, we are here to ensure that DARA has correctly administered the rules and the legislation. When I heard that, I felt we were wasting our time. Because in my mind, everything was administered correctly. But there are many other reasons why the case would possibly result in a positive outcome. I feel that the panel should be deciding if the farmer or farm business is right or wrong. I know in one case where Dara overturned the panel's decision, which was in favour of the farmer, the explanation they give was that further information was taken into account. Surely if Dara don't allow additional information, how can they do it? It just seems unfair. Therefore, an Agriculture Consultants Association, we think that additional information should be allowed prior to the stage two independent panel setting, but restricted to be added at least two weeks prior to the panel meeting. We feel that the, the panel has more empathy with the farmer or farm business than the department has. And here, we, see, we feel that the panel should consider consist of a legal person who hopefully understands agriculture law, a practical person with a knowledge of the different schemes, as well as a person qualified in mental health. Farmers who have lost their appeal tell us it appears their staff protect one another. In some cases, the off case officer states to, to discusses the case with the other department staff who were maybe involved in stage one, and at the end of the day, they all agree with the original decision. They appear to be protecting each other. No matter what the ROD is for, I think there should be a better communication and consultation at the initial stages. For example, and I have said this many times to the department, especially in an active farmer assessment, why do you not go out and see what the business is actually doing? but they prefer to see the paperwork and bank accounts, etc. A farm visit, visit doesn't suit every appeal, but where it does, I feel it, it could save a lot of time and money. Even a telephone call or an email would help, and at least the farm business would feel more at ease. If you compare this to a business splitting and forming two new businesses, their staff would go out and check that the new business is, is farming completely separate, if they can do it there, surely they can do it in the case of, of, of say, an active farmer decision. Agriculture consultants members feel that there should be more transparency in the appeal procedure. Who are the technical people looking at the appeal? What are their qualifications? Are they interpreting the rules and legislation correctly? Or are they gold-plating them? What back, legal background have they or are they just civil service doing the job? One thing that is really annoying, and many of my colleagues agree, is that the penalty doesn't match the crime. It is a percentage of the single farm payment, and if they decide it is intentional rather than negligent, this can be very severe. How do you think a farmer feels if he's penalized 20,000 or more, or even has to pay back a single farm payment? One very important aspect our members have highlighted is the stress and the effect of a, on a farmer's mental health when they have, have to proceed with a, a ROD. All this is extremely stressful to, on the farm business, their family, and even their agents, so changes must be considered. As you know, farmers who have had their panel recommendation were turned by their have the opportunity to go to a judicial review or to the Ombudsman. Probably the Ombudsman is the cheapest route, but I have no experience with that. What I do know is that the cost of a judicial review is massive and will put many farmers off from taking the case forward. The issues associated with going to a judicial review have been very well documented in the Irish Farmers Journal on the radio. I feel that many farmers 
could not even afford the cost of a judicial review. Many also say they're too scared that if they win the judicial review, dear will and dear are criticised, they will receive further cross compliance inspections. Finally, Mr. Chairman, there's a there's discussion at the moment for an alternative, and I know that recently Brian Little and James O'Brien spoke to you and they suggested of setting up a Supreme Agricultural Appeal Panel with top agriculture laws barristers. We recommend that the Department seriously looks at this as we move forward and hopefully improve the whole ROD process. I think as it is there that has the final say in the appeal process, they should be held to account. If the panel makes a positive decision, it's so going for the applicant to hear that the department does not accept the panel's decision. As I've said earlier, they have the opportunity to go to judicial review or the ombudsman, but in the case of the judicial review, it's a massively expensive and at that stage, many just bite their lip and say, forget it, and that is over. The department have won. Then there's the question of the older cases or those referred to as historic cases. I asked our members to give me an indication of many cases they have. And to be honest, we would only have a couple, but I may have more work. I think it's very important that these historic cases are also looked at. If the appealant is confident in their case and the independent panel supported them, I feel that the, that the suggested fee of a £1,500 will be a lot less than the cost of judicial review and should be considered. Mr Chairman, that is my submission and I thank you again for asking me to give my views today on behalf of the Agriculture Consultants Association. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, before uh, there's a number of members who have indicated they want to speak, um, and there's um, and before we go around the room, I'm just going to ask you that there you, you had indicated about the, the the JRs, and you know we're, pe we're picking that up, uh, you know from farmers we're dealing with, and from other bodies as well that the that the prohibitive cost of a JR, a lot of farmers just give up at that stage and go away and they don't they don't get the the, the, the redress that they deserve. Um, we see that as a problem. What, what's been your experience of the Ombudsman's route, uh, David? Um, you know, what, what what has been your experience of that Ombudsman route? As I was saying, Mr Chairman, I have no experience at all. Um, I know one uh, agent has uh, gone that route mm -hmm. in the, in just in the process at the moment. So I can't comment on it at all. Jim, Jim there, Jim, you drop your hand yeah. there. I, I have experience because uh, like I, I, I'm involved in this this number of years, we're looking at the history of this, uh, your time's precious and so is mine at this stage. But anyway, um, I, I think I mentioned in the papers that I sent you both the Ombudsman and Judicial Review, and, uh, and David talked about cost, but the Ombudsman, there's actually no cost. You, you, it used to be you had to have either uh, go through an MLA or an MP to get to an Ombudsman, but the Ombudsman, I think, uh, for clarity, can can only look at cases of, of maladministration. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the base, which is really nothing to do. You have to go in and improve maladministration, plus the fact I, I have had cases and been successful with cases in the Ombudsman's position. The, Ombud, the Ombudsman will send a, 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 a legal representative from their office to to talk to you and brief you. Some of your parties will know they have had uh, representatives at cases from, from all parties nearly that I have been with. Um, but they they are limited and and if you like, what financial discipline they can have but they, they, there's a different situation a judicial review you're 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 looking for for specific reasons but the ombudsman you can approach the ombudsman will decide if your case has merit and as I say it's a case of maladministration it's the, it's the way we would look at all cases first before we, we look at anything else um David has quite rightly said judicial reviews are prohibitive in cost. 
Uh, what what we want to see, if, if I could just m make this very brief at the moment, because there's no call to add to it. Um, we want to see as equity and fair play for all farmers. Um, there are anyone, there are 27,000 farm businesses or thereabouts where, where errors can happen. Um, the independence, people query us about the independence of the independent panel. In other words, who funds them, who instructs them, who trains them, and who gives them the ground rules on what they're to look for. I have plenty of experience with uh, independent panels as well. I have experience of where they did turn down. Uh, once if a panel had, had agreed with the producer, where then it used to be a ministerial role to, to make a decision. Uh, it's now, as far as I know, chief paying officer. Um, but really, what, what we don't want and what we have, uh, the, the agriculture... Agriculture is an industry in its own. We don't want another industry built up around it either because we have, we're, we're, we're sitting here today all talking about agriculture and all the rest, but there are, there are people out there who earn a living. Uh, David mentioned mental health. It's almost 30 years uh, that I, well, a couple of us here have been personally involved with Farmer Crisis Network and actually brought it over, which is now a... Uh, uh, type of rural support, but at that stage, uh, this this worked across the water and it came in actually from Germany in the first place. Uh, and it was different, it was walking with. Um, people are uh, afraid. People are even uh, uh, reticent about going to independent panels because they're not sure what uh, they'll face. You have to convince a person that that, that the panel is there to give them their opportunity to speak. Again, I, I would support the, the idea that um, the, the panel should be fit to take additional evidence. The problem with the panel, which I think was maybe missed there, but was that the panel can only make a recommendation. And that's where we find, and a lot of producers find, that if you have an independent panel set up to make a recommendation, if you're going to set up as an independent panel of appeals, there has to be some way where it's not just a recommendation. They find for something. If you go to court and appeal, you'll generally know the result of that. Um, so there are a few issues there. We we don't want you, you have you have people because of delays and appeals and one thing or another and who possibly won their appeal, who already have financial uh, burden, who perhaps are money is withheld from them, which they eventually get, but that's adding to their financial burden at the time. Um, again, they discussed there, uh, there's, in David's comment, he mentioned the, the people who looked at us in the first place as uh, civil servants. Um, but what we are concerned with that the initial checks on appeals are basically ticking boxes, particularly in the active farming category that people don't understand or haven't a full understanding of uh, cash flows of the way agriculture actually works when you don't run a calendar year uh, and a farmer sometimes is one of the things is you, you can't, you don't have the benefits or you don't show the benefits uh, of your your business. Uh, but in those cases, <clears throat> it's, for example, if you, you want to take people who sell forage, sell silage, they generally sell in the spring. They could sell in the winter time and not get paid for the next year. So that wouldn't be reflected. HMRC, it, it'll be done in the official tax returns, anything, income, outgoings. And also, when you, people do tax returns, there are accruals, deferrals, credits and debits showing up on them to show activity and the reflect activity. There, there, there needs to be uh, the technical aspect of it, I would agree as well, that we have asked on occasion who the technical person, what qualifications they had, who actually sent in a report because... Uh, to us, in some cases, there were glaring omissions 
or things that had to be corrected. Um, I, I would feel that a lot more could be done and dialogue early in the process. We might have to not to go this far. Uh, David talked there about a Supreme Panel and rec looking at retrospective cases. If we, and the Minister I know has said that from his point of view, um, that uh, he, he would kick the views of the panel fully on board and that the, the panel decision, as far as he is concerned, would stand. Uh, the talk there about uh, Dr. Jason Foy, and he has spoken to ourselves, <clears throat> and they're talking about a review of this. But the one thing in all of this uh, is that the, if they, you want to change to look at the panel decisions have been binding, where has this to go in legislation? Can it be done in legislation? Can we have guarantees through legislation? Because we believe that there may be possibly part of this can be done, but there's no legislative process which could impede this or would have to be discussed. I think that's a uh, uh, work to be undertaken by yourselves if you're to look at this. <clears throat> and in and, and my opinion at the moment, yeah, the, the Agriculture Committee is looking at this, which I believe they should do uh, at all aspects of it. Uh, people are not, from our point of view, are not entirely happy with the process. Um, there needs to be more agricultural experience. I'll go back to what I said, not just ticking boxes. Has this been done? Has that been done? Agriculture doesn't work that way. And... Uh, the, 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 the people in the civil service aren't necessary. Well, they aren't there because <clears throat> of a background in agriculture or because of experience with agriculture. They have selected questions. If you fall into that category, uh, and I know about the activities, I actually have uh, one tomorrow, and I have them regularly. But uh, we, again, would look at, some people too who come to us and say, well, as far as we're concerned with the parameters of what we know about the fields, you fall down in this, that and the other. We get them to identify uh, exactly what they think was wrong. In a lot of cases, we think the farmer is correct and we'll try and resolve that if possible before independent panels. If we're to have an independent panel, one that's totally independent, uh, want the panel's views to be adhered to, that uh, that they're, they're, they're not just given an opinion, that whatever they say will be binding. The legislation, all parts of it have to be examined. I think this is the, a rule the committee has to take to look on board at this. Uh, if we get on that, and I have spoken to the people about the Supreme Panel, and everybody has read a lot of this in the press, and that's where a lot of information came from. If it is necessary that there needs to be a, a, a body to, which can come in and oversee this, uh, someone has to look at funding that body, of course. Uh, again, we want equity. David mentioned different sizes of farms. And we're not happy with the percentage uh, of single farm payments or what uh, on that basis being used. Um, I believe there's looking at uh, because you can be you can lose a hundred percent, you can use lose a, a clawback of a similar figure. I think that's going to be looked at. But we need to see what can be done under proper legislation and what we can have. There would be lesser need for a supreme panel if we could get the proper grounding for an independent. And I'm talking from a member's perspective, from actually uh, farmers that we have discussed this with and in our own committee. And uh, we have no objections to people looking at a supreme panel. Uh, the, the costs and all of these would have to be looked at as well, <clears throat> because my understanding is that that would be 
people would have to look at this advisedly and see what expense to put into it. At the present moment, as you know, there was a discussion document out there about uh, the charges for appeal panels at the moment. Uh, ourselves, I'm not sure when, when David had a response, but I know the, the EFUs was something similar to ourselves. We didn't want to see any increases in fees for panels because we think people have a right to go without uh, additional expenditure. So that's the, the, my kind. I would start off with the Ombudsman. I tried to cover my part of the ground there to see where I come from, perhaps see any questions if those had covered a lot of what you may have been asking anyway. All right? Sorry, I'm not picking up your sound, Daglan. Thanks for that, Jim. I, I'd be self-muted, so I'd... Uh, <laughs> 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 I'd rather room, would you? You have a hard to mute guy, you'd say something. <laughs> Yeah. William, yes. William, you, you're on. You're muted now. Too. Everybody's muted. Right. I'm okay, and I am okay, and I. Uh, Is that okay? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John and Jim, for your presentation. Uh, no, it, this has been a, a contentious issue for for some years now. Uh, the situation of independent panels decision not been final. Uh, we had, as you said, the employee, uh, and even the minister now saying going forward that they're looking at this. Uh, if the independent panel, if it can be legislated for that, that the independent panel's decision is final, I then don't see a need for a supreme panel. Would I be right in saying that? If it is accepted by the department, and we can legislate for that. That there is that the independent panel's decision is final. Uh, there really isn't a need for a supreme panel in that situation. Is that right? Is that uh, David or myself? I do right. I I I give you an opinion. It, it has been suggested supreme panel. We have no objections to consideration being given to a Supreme Panel. What I did say there and what I would repeat is there would be a lesser need if the independent panel, at the, at the present moment, the, the, the suggestion for Supreme Panel would be simply because my understanding is the people who are working on the Supreme Panel could maybe enlighten you better than me, but uh, because we have the situation under where the independent panel can can only make a recommendation and that therefore DERA makes the decision or can overturn that, uh, we don't think that's correct. Uh, if it takes a Supreme Panel to look at that, or David has also mentioned their retrospective cases, um, something needs to be looked at on, on those uh, I don't know what, what your views are on retrospective cases or who could or would look at them. Um, but there would be a lesser need. But I, I assume this would come out in a consultation to which we would put forward. And I presume you as a committee will be looking at this. I don't know what, what David wants to add to that. And of course, historic cases have already been adjudicated on by an independent panel, but not accepted <laughs> by the department. Not right. That's... Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, okay then, William. Yeah, I'll leave. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, gentlemen, and, and it's good to see you. Um, just uh, first of all, Jim, picking up on your point, um, you're definitely right there about the the issue around an independent panel, and if there's some sort of a, a, a sort of a, you like an early resolution mechanism that could be inbuilt into the system so that it, it, and I know the department will say, we review all these again and stuff, but where the department will know that there are cases, whenever they're going to a panel, that they're shaking off grounds. And if that can be, if that can be through a proper formal resolution mechanism, if it can be looked at and resolved in the interest of both parties, I think that should be done. Just moving on then uh, through to the, the additional stage two, and I was listening very carefully there, um, 
in, in regard to the, the, the independent panel. And yes, I, I think it should be chaired by a legally qualified person uh, to oversee the mechanism because there have been in enough tribunals, uh, housing, housing panels and social security tribunals to see how the input of that person is. And if, if the insight into the law, I'm not too sure about agricultural law, but the insight into the law and how it's done by process and adhered to by the law, is the important bit. Um, bringing that on then to, uh, I'm not quite sure about a qualified person in mental health issues because uh, I don't think that it's there to adjudicate on someone's mental health. It's there to look at if there are mitigating mental health circumstances which is presented in evidence to the panel. It's definitely there to look at that and it should be, and if need be, to, to adjourn to seek further uh, medical evidence. I, I accept that. Um, but I don't think in, in the instance uh, having a member spe specifically qualified mental health problems would be necessarily the route to go. I, I just I might be wrong on that, but I, I really don't think so. Yes, definitely a good point that a stage two additional evidence should be submitted. But you're right there, David. It should be submitted. The cutoff should be a fortnight beforehand because you have to be fair to panel members and others at the department or whatever who have to look at the evidence and be fit because some of it may be one page, some of it multi, may be multi-page documents. You don't know, so you have to be fair. You don't want to be going along to another panel to have it adjourned again because of lack of time for, for members to look at it. Um, penalties, you, you mentioned there as well, David, I presume you do accept that people have to adhere to the law and, and whatever measure or fashion it is. I know some of the penalties may be, may be steep and may be difficult, uh, but if there are blatant breaches of the law which are overseen, there, there's really nothing you can do about that. Um, you know, the, if there are, say, for example, blatant environmental breaches, um, well, what do you do in those situations? Um, people are saying to us that there are circumstances where there are blatant environmental breaches and the pressure's on from the public to attend to and deal with those. So uh, that compliance and the penalty should fit the crime I think is a principle that a crime or a breach, whatever that may be, is a principle that we all should look at. If, it's in, if elements of it are unfair, yes, we do that, but I think that needs to be looked at. Uh, it needs to be looked at in that context. Finally, the Supreme Agricultural Appeal Panel, and I would support the idea of the, the independent panel itself that its arbitration uh, being binding upon the department I really, where you have other inbuilt factors around the place, um, including the ombudsman, if a process hasn't been properly adhered to, I really don't see, and I'm meant to be convinced of, but I'm not convinced at the moment, of the need for a Supreme Agricultural Appeal Panel where a case is reopened. And let's not forget, if it's reopened at that level and person's having to pay, well, it's a £1,500 fine, or, or not fine, fee to go to that. Let's not forget that the department itself would have access under due process because it has to, would have access to that Supreme Agricultural uh, Appeal Panel. And really what you do is you deal with the issue at one side where the independent panel is bending upon the department and then you reopen it at a, a pretty high pricey um, a Supreme Agricultural Appeal Panel. So um, I'm not convinced of the merits of it. There may be merits in it that I don't see. Um, the retrospection issue, I think there were a number of cases, I think it was five cases where the department had overturned those and it'd be an issue for legislation then to determine how far you go back retrospectively on those and I'm sure whenever the department's dealing with this before us that, that should be dealt with and then built as well. So uh, thanks very much for your time and your input there. It's always good to hear it from the people who are the, the seasoned practitioners. Uh, at the cold face there, and uh, it's very valuable. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That's it. We'll bring Rosemary in there, maybe. Rosemary, yeah. do you want to? Yes, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It just, it's in relation to the the panel, the uh, panel, the independent panel that you speak of. How would you like to see the makeup of that panel? For example, obviously a, a legal person in it, uh, 
maybe maybe some medical person if there is a need for that. How would you like to see the makeup? Someone with an agricultural experience or whatever. Maybe I, Jim, I, I'd come in there first. Uh, oh, apparently, yes. Mm -hmm. the, 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 over those uh, last comments, there, there was a lot of questions and comments. Um, the, the reason why I mentioned that um, we would like to see somebody from the, the mental health aspect on, on the panel is because we have seen some of the doctor's reports and we understand how they, they, our clients have been feeling over, not just over the, 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 the past few weeks, but for, in previous times. And a doctor writes a, a note but sometimes it would take another doctor to read and hasn't really given the, the, the full um, aspect of the person's mental health and how he's been feeling and what was wrong with him. So if there was a mental health hazard, uh, comments on the uh, uh, paperwork or through for the appeal, I think somebody from, from that side of the, the, uh, the end of it should be, should be there. Um, so definitely the, the independent panel, yes, you need somebody that, that understands the law and especially agriculture law, somebody that has a practical knowledge of the, um, the case that's been looked at. Uh, say if, if it was for a single farm payment like the farmer, somebody that uh, understands what the department actually mean in that there because I've asked them many times, you know, what their definition of an active farmer, which I think, Northern Ireland is the only place that has that definition because I, I, I can't find it in England, Scotland, or Wales. So um, you need somebody that, that really knows everything uh, that's going on. Um, the other point I just at this stage would say would be the, the Supreme uh, Panel. Um, the main merit of, of having someone like that would be that if the client decides that uh, they're right, the department are wrong, and uh, the options, as we've said, is a judicial review. This panel would uh, replace the judicial review and save a lot of time and money for the client. So that's one of the, the, the merits that I would say of it. Um, and if it goes on to look at historic cases, um, that's all going to be very good. Jim, you can maybe comment more. Well, there's a couple of three things. The, 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 I, I have relatives both in psychiatry and psychology. And I, I, I don't mind, and we have at different times submitted evidence of people's mental state. Um, and I would have a bit of experience with it. Um, that, to have somebody sitting in, on a panel, well and good, but um, it's something that a lot of people take very personally. It's something, having discussed this with people, professionals I know, um, because it's, it's, it's not something you primarily discuss with a panel uh, or people want to discuss with a panel. Somebody can view if it if, if we could if you want to take it that it could be viewed by somebody with proper uh, experience or proper qualifications. The panel itself, I'd agree with you. Um, to to sit down as you have done, I'm sure, David, with a panel as I have done, and explain to them the the different uh, aspects of agriculture and what something exactly means. It's a wee bit late in the day, whenever you start. Yeah. But, uh, what? Sorry, I didn't hear that. But there's some, David, your camera's on. Oh, um, sorry, Tim, I was telling you. They call me here. I was watching. <laughs> but anyway, terribly. Hey, it's all right. Um, no, I, I, somebody legal, obviously, somebody with experience in agriculture. And I go back to somebody where you mentioned before, even a stage further or a stage back, somebody checking 
at a stage one or stage two with experience in agriculture who understands exactly what activity is supposed to be because uh, the tests they have here to me don't stack up. Um, and again, I, I've been advocate of trying to get things sorted out before we go this far, but but I, I agree with you about the panel thing. The, the, the person's health and well-being, as they have been involved in this sort of type thing for 25 years, uh, as paramount as well. Um, and I think that's been dis- perhaps in another paper you've got. But um, I, I, I would... Uh, that, that's typical of a panel. We're down to, I think, at the present moment, it used to be a three-person panel, down to a two-person panel. Again, if the panel's only making a recommendation, and I'm back to what I said originally, the selection of the panel at the present moment is at the discretion of DERA, is my understanding. Uh, who trained that panel, or I presume provide training in some form for that panel before they take on cases. Um, I, I don't know what that involves. I don't know the background. Uh, I don't know the background of some of the technical people that have for writing these up. There's so much, to be quite honest, and you have quite rightly said before that you get a fail and there's not enough clarity or information. There's, there's plenty of people, as you well know, which is not signed when it comes to you, but who did check it and who looked at it? So... Simply on the panel thing, yes. Um, the, the mental health one, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how you would approach the mental health person on the panel because obviously if this is a case you're going to bring up, uh, it, it seems to be selecting people because they have put in something uh, to do with that. I perhaps would prefer to somebody having looked at that and doing a recommendation because, uh, as I say, from experience and from talking to trained people, uh, a lot of that, you know, e- even to include letters when we're doing submissions, we would actually talk to the doctor and to uh-huh. somebody properly qualified before we would even put that on a file to send in. Yeah. Thank you. I, I understand what you mean. And thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll move around to Harry. We're, 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 we'll be cut off in the next few minutes by broadcast. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Harry, Harry. Thank you very much. And thank you, David and Jim. Thanks, Chair. What would you suggest in terms of changes procedurally? to the process which would enable the opportunity for better information to claimants, better communication between DERA, claimants and stakeholders? You want, well, I, I, I'll say a word or two on that. Communication at the moment uh, with DERA and, 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 and stakeholders, or do you mean producers in general now, which? Just stakeholders, yeah, yeah. Or just the lack of David and ourselves? Yeah. No, no. We, we, we communicate fairly regularly with, you know, with the appeals people. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually the producers that we're concerned with not understanding legislation. As David rightly says, when you get a file back out, you get so many pages of the legislation relevant to whatever it is your opinion. You just, just don't understand that. Let, let, let's face fact. Mm-hmm. It's there and it's stuck in and there's a bit highlighted and somebody then has to try and explain. You know what I mean? So yeah. plain English, I think, would be a start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. And not, not to treat people as everybody, because David quite rightly mentioned with the age profile of farmers. Yeah. Everybody's not au okay fait with electronic systems and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So... Better communication, General. David, do you want to say? All I would say is that, uh, yes, uh, as Jim said, that the, uh, we as a stakeholder regularly meet the department, yeah. but it's the, the, the client or the producer, uh, we would feel sorry because he gets a letter, and that's the only communication he gets from the department. There's no way to 
looked out and the discussions with him, I looked at it and checks it out. Uh, and if there was better communication, even a, a, a farm visit or a, a telephone call, uh, that would solve a lot of problems rather than going to stage one or something. Okay. So, listen, what, in your view, can the department do to, to better inform farmers in relation to the pains process and alleviate fear and anxiety in terms of using the mechanism? Uh, just, just what we said is, you know, contact them and discuss what their problem is. Yep, yep. Well, no communication at all. Yep. I'm sorry, Jamie, I don't mean to rush you, but it's just for a no. running short in time. No, so that's okay. I, was going, I was going to ask you if the uh, independent panels are adequately staffed and resourced and as the necessary powers. I mean, that might negate the Supreme Agricultural Panel, but you say that um, the Supreme Panel would still maybe have merits and should still be given consideration. So, okay, yep, that's interesting. So, gentlemen, that'll do me if you want a few wee comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for that there, um, Jim and David. Um, always great to hear from the front line, I have to say that. Um, we find it really helpful. And uh, I want to thank you very, very much for this. Sorry. So, listen, we'll be in contact with you in the time ahead. So. I hope you have a nice day and a nice weekend. Okay. That's okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Much. Okay. Good luck to you. Okay, right. folks. Um, okay. All the best now. Right. Okay, then on. Uh, take care, Jim and David. Okay, folks. Right. I'm going to move on very swiftly here. Um, item item eight in the agenda will take us up to half an hour, right? To do to allow the committee to, to agree our position on the independent panels. And I suggest that we defer that to next week. Um, and, and that will mean that one of the oral briefings for next week will be changed to a written briefing. So at least take we have a time till thrice this one out. Is that okay, members? Are we defer that one today? The the our position for on the independent panel stuff? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, members. I'm gonna go rush on now to uh, item nine, a written briefing on the statutory instrument, the air quality legislative functions amendment regulations twenty twenty one. Uh, the papers are at page 281. I want to advise members that the SA was last on the agenda at the meeting on the 25th of February when members sought clarification on whether anaerobic digesters are included in the statutory instrument regulations and the officials are on standby today will provide this answer to the committee. Members also agreed to defer consideration of the SA. The committee is asked to indicate whether it is content for the data minister to give consent for UK ministers to lay the statement in the UK Parliament. The SA was scheduled for laying on the 25th of February in Westminster and is due to come into force 21 days after the day uh, after the day on which it was is made. The SA will be subject to a draft affirmative resolution procedure and its ter territorial extent is extended uh, to <coughs> all of the regions. The SA contains technical and minimal policy amendments and has been given a Category 2 assessment by dear officials. The Air Quality Legislative Functions Amendment Regulation 21 have no impact on the decision making or operating of the legislation here and will, will not constitute a, a substantive uh, policy change. Uh, we have Caroline uh, Barry and Paul Nugent uh, here on Starleaf. Um, can you provide, can you hear Caroline and uh, Caroline and Colin? He's in there. Caroline and Colin. Hi, Caroline. Uh, and Colin. Colin, Colin I, speaking, I can hear you. Yeah, and Caroline, I see Caroline. Yes, Caroline here as well. Yeah, can I ask yourselves to provide clarification on whether uh, anaerobic digesters are included in the SA? I hear silence, so I think I'll proceed uh, yeah, with yeah, answering that one. Yes, on ahead. Sorry, um, apologies. Yeah. The, the SI uh, in itself is uh, an amendment SI to correct some deficiencies as a result of EU exit. So it doesn't deal directly with anaerobic digesters. What it refers to is a pollutant release and transfer register of which some of the information that is included does relate to 
anaerobic digesters. And we have consulted with our colleagues in Northern Ireland Environment Agency who have indicated that some of the AD plant in Northern Ireland are indeed included in the European Pollutant Transfer and Release Register. Okay. Um, are members okay with that explanation? Could I just ask a wee follow-up, Chair? If that's okay? Go for it, Claire. Yes, absolutely. Well, and when you're saying that some ADs are included, is there a size? I mean, why some and not all? Does it depend on the size and the emissions from the ADs? Yes, you're on, you're on the right lines there. It depends on the type of waste that they're they're using, and it also depends on the thresholds. So some of them will operate under a PPC uh, uh, authorization or permit, and some will operate under a waste management license. Okay, and what the ones that are contained within this SI are they um, animal waste burning ADs, or are they um, other other materials? Well, as I said, uh, this SI doesn't relate directly to AD plants, so they're not included in the SI, if you like. Um, precisely which AD plant in Northern Ireland are included in the register, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think also, you know, there's this concern that we've had very limited time. You know, the letter was sent on the 24th of February, and the SI is to be put to Mr. Button Westminster on the 25th of February, so there was very little time as well, you know, for any meaningful scrutiny on our on the committee's part on this, you know. But um so members are members okay then? Uh um get, get, no more questions. Sorry, Mr Chairman. Yeah. Sorry, can I can I just just give you a quick update? Um, um right. the SI has actually DEFRA have taken the decision not to actually lay the SI uh, until consent has been given by Northern Ireland and or, or Scottish counterparts. Um, so uh, once once the dis the consent has been given by yourselves and by the minister, uh, then we'll we'll contact DEFRA and let them know. Okay. Uh, thank you for that clarification, uh, Caroline. So, um, can I say, are, are, are members content that we note this essay uh, based on their previous form words that we had previously agreed to the committee? Okay. Right. Thank you, uh, Caroline and Colin. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, members, number 10 is a written briefing, Green Growth Update. Uh, the briefing's at page 286. I want to advise members of the department last brief the committee uh, on the green growth at the meeting on the 12th of November, and the briefing is an update on significant developments since then. Um, you know, how, how, do, uh, has members had the chance to take a look over this, or if there's any questions that you, um, you want to raise, or that we can forward to the department? Okay, uh, if there's any questions, you can possibly follow them to Barbara by close the play today. Would that be okay? And forward them to me if that's okay, please. Jim. That's right, Stella. You're 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 back on there. That was Barbara who was doing the business now, so uh, that's okay. Uh, can I get agreement from? Uh, can I get agreement to request the department that keeps the committee informed of progress in relation to the strategy framework document, which is scheduled to issue by the end of the month? Are you okay with that? Okay, and any issues you have to do with that there, can you fire them on to the, the clerk, Stella, by the close of play today? Okay, members, um, going moving then on swiftly to the uh, item number 11. It's uh, co correspondence. Uh, correspondence is page 293. Um, are we members content to action the correspondence as suggested in the index, page of 290? Members okay? Okay, uh, forward work program. Uh, the draft work forward work program is page 391. There has been changes uh, or amendments from last week. Uh, are we okay with the forward work program? Okay. Okay, members, in number 13, under any other business, Patsy has an issue that he wishes to raise in relation to uh, animal cruelty register. Patsy? Patsy, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. You remain unmuted. Yeah, so, start again. We can hear you now. We're good to go now. Uh, thanks very much for that. All I wanted was a brief from the department chair as to, I know it's a big issue and, and a lot of cases have come up, including some of our councillors have been in touch with me, about the need for an animal cruelty register and um, the need to have it indeed on an all-island basis because, as we know, some of these culprits are 
or moving uh, jurisdictions irrespective of what those jurisdictions are. So in the first instance, could we get an update from the department? It can be written to see just how the department's advancing this. And indeed, I think it might even be cross-cutting with, with other departments, DOJ. So if we could, in the first instance, get a written brief, and that would be much appreciated, Chair. Thank you. I'm sure all members are all content with that, yes? Members happy enough? Are members, any other issues you want to raise? No. Okay. Um, okay, members. So the date and time next meeting, next meeting will be on Thursday, the 18th of March, um, virtual at, at 10 a.m. And again, as usual, be streamed online and on the web, family website. So thank you very much for attending this morning. And um, I hope you have a nice remainder of the day and we'll adjourn the meeting now, okay? Hey, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.